Hello, 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 everyone. Uh, welcome again. Uh, it's uh, fantastic to see you all guys online uh, for these final days of Solar Summer School. You hear me okay? Um, I'm Ming Han Dai I'm from Xiamen University. Uh, some of you may know me. I'm also the co chair for the Solar CSSC. And uh, Oh, uh, we are getting pretty much familiar with the Solar Summer School now. It's uh, virtual though. And uh, we're here to explore again Solar's core themes and learn together. Uh, again, this is a, 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 a co-learning process. And yesterday was very engaging and interesting. And the recording now uh, is available to watch on Hula. If you would like to go back and rewatch it, or you won't be able to attend yesterday's session. Um, today, we're going to focus on our fifth and the final theme, that is ocean biogeochemistry by geochemical control atmospheric chemistry. We have, a, I think it would be fantastic, a, a presentation followed by a practical session on numerical modeling. And then uh, we'll finish our final installment of rapid five post presentation by you guys, okay? Um, we have uh, quite a lot to cover, so we'll try our best to stick on the time, both for the lectures and all these short presentations. Um, a couple of uh, housekeeping and the logistics. Uh, there will be time for question at the end of the session, so please raise digitally raise your hand in the QA. Uh, remember, you can also send a message to a lecture on the HUA afterwards to ask further question. And I would like to encourage you guys to put your video on throughout the session. So just make the, uh, the, 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 the school vivid, okay? Uh, without further ado, I think we'll get started to the presentation. Um, the first speaker is uh, Professor Mark Talif Latif uh, from Malaysia. He's be, he'll be talking about ocean biogeochemical control on atmospheric chemistry. This will be a, a, a introductory talk. So um, followed by uh, two other talks I will introduce a little bit later. So Talif, it's all yours. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Min Handai. Okay, my name is uh, Muhammad Talib Latif. Uh, call me Talib, actually. In Malaysia, we usually call people by their second name. The title of my presentation today actually uh, is about ocean biogeochemical control on atmospheric uh, chemistry. Title for the team five. This is an introduction about the team five, ocean emission of reactive gases and aerosol influence atmospheric chemistry and oxidizing capacity, air quality, and stratospheric ozone. If you can see over here, we have coastal macrophytes, a pelagic ecosystem that can contribute to the amount of chemical to the atmosphere, for example, halocarbon, nitrogen, oxygen, organic substance, that can contribute to the amount of aerosol. And this chemical will also interact with photo oxidation processes and also involved with uh, several interaction, including produce chemical that capable to uh, involve with ozone destruction. One of uh, important chemical that can be emitted from the sea surface microlayer or ocean surface is volatile gases from oceans. Among atmospherically uh, important volatile gases are those containing sulfur, nitrogen, and halogen. And these gases play a critical role not in global biogeochemical cycling and a wide range of atmospheric processes because these uh, VOCs or volatile gases has capability to form marine aerosol and also modify it also contribute to the formation of uh, tropospheric ozone and also ozone layer destruction 
and involved with photo oxid oxidation, cycling, and stratospheric ozone loss in the upper part of the atmosphere. This is an example of a process I found from a paper by Newcomans at all 2018 that shows the ocean land atmosphere interactions between uh, the chemical actually uh, in, from the uh, land that involve with interactions with the uh, ocean and also contribute to the amount of volatile organic compound as well as aerosol in the atmosphere. This also affected by uh, heat transfer and also a radiative energy from the sun as well as circles within the ocean itself. This is another study by uh, Professor Carpenter, 2012. They indicate the interaction between ocean and amount of chemical in the atmosphere. For example, sea spray can produce uh, aerosol, can interact with other processes and produce uh, heterogeneous uh, chemistry that affect the ozone and oxidative uh, capacity. This aerosol also can contribute by the amount of dimethyl sulfate and this chemical will interact and also involved with oxidation process and produce a cloud in the atmosphere. This is an example of how ultrafine particle can behave as cloud condensation nuclei in the atmosphere due to the character of this uh, aerosol in the atmosphere. Another study by Hopkins et al. 2020 also indicate the capability of coastal macropite to produce uh, dissolved organic materials to the atmosphere as well as volatile organic compounds from pelagic ecosystem due to the involvement of uh, phytoplankton to the atmosphere that produce uh, VOC that can produce uh, secondary aerosol and also contribute to the several chemical processes in the atmosphere, including the ozone destruction. This is a surface area and metabolic data from coastal zone and open oceans suggested by Gutoso et al. 1998. You can see that the coastal ecosystem, estuary, coral reef, salt marsh, mangrove, remaining self and other part ocean can contribute the, 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 the production of uh, carbon to the atmosphere. So the respiration process within the ecosystem also will decrease the amount of carbon. So, so, so based on this study, we can find that several ecosystems such as uh, coral reef, salt marsh, and mangrove can contribute to the amount of carbon production to the atmosphere. One example of the ocean emissions to the atmosphere is a dimethyl sulfide or DMS from ocean surface. Uh, dimethyl sulfide is an important sulfur containing trace gas in the atmosphere. It can form aerosol and it presents in oceanic uh, surface water at contraction sufficient to contain a considerable net flux of DMS from ocean to the atmosphere that produce sulfate and also cloud condensation nuclei to the atmosphere. This is an example of how uh, DMS is produced to the atmosphere and also affected the interaction between aerosol as well as the formation of more cloud by formation of cloud con condensation nuclei in the atmosphere. This is how uh, DMS can affect the climate change. You can see that the coral reef, for example, and pelagic phytoplankton can produce uh, DMS to the atmosphere and then form a sulfate aerosol. And after that, cloud condensation nuclei that produce uh, more cloud and create 
cloud albedo to the atmosphere. This for sure also affected by the radiation budget that can contribute again to the formation of uh, deposition of uh, aerosol back to the ocean surface. Another uh, chemical that quite important from the ocean is uh, halocarbon from sea surface. This halocarbon actually uh, can contribute to the destruction of uh, ozone layer. So this photochemical degradation of volatile uh, halocarbon release halogen radicals such as chloride, bromide, and iodide and destroy the ozone in the upper part of the atmosphere, ozone layer. This is an example of study in, in Malaysia that I want to show you in terms of halocarbon from seaweed, from several species uh, within the tropical region that produce several uh, halocarbon to the atmosphere. This study by Kang et al. 2021. So the, the, the interaction between the chemical that produce halogen to the halocarbon to the atmosphere and this uh, chemical has ability to disrupt the ozone layer. And then this is study by one of our group member. Uh, I think this is a uh, cruise from uh, Malacca Street. Uh, this is Malaysian Peninsula on the left hand side. This is uh, Borneo, Malaysia. So uh, based on this measurement, we found that the concentration of halocarbon quite high in the area that uh, quite busy, uh, such as in the Malacca Street compared to the open sea. So on the left hand side, concentration of halocarbon quite high compared to the open sea in the middle in the South China Sea. Uh, values of uh, <coughs> Several hydrocarbon are higher in the Malacca Street, as I mentioned, and uh, compared to other regions. This is because of the intrusion of uh, nutrient from, from land to the uh, oceans, decrease in concentration from the heavily industrial coastal and open uh, compared to open ocean, ocean, contribute to the amount of uh, hydrocarbon and release by seaweed from ocean in around Malaysia. This is another example of uh, several uh, seaweed that can be produced uh, from ocean to the atmosphere. This is based on uh, one of our group member PhD study, Nazir et al. 2013. So values of this uh, halocarbon, as I mentioned, quite high in the, in the area that are very busy with the industrial and coastal activities and can be indicated by the amount of chlorophyll. Other than that, uh, our group also study on the concentration of uh, surfactant from the sea surface uh, microlayer. We also found that in many cases, the concentration of ocean is very high in the estuarine area or coastal area that influenced by uh, urban, urbanizations or, or industrial activities. So this surfactant actually can increase solubility, can go up to the atmosphere, reduce the surface tension of the droplet, create smaller droplet and increase albedo as well as change uh, temperature. So surfactant can affect the climate change. Uh, other than that, we also study on the amount of uh, biological water organic compound uh, by using uh, determination of several compounds such as isoprene. This is uh, uh, initiated by, by study from, from Siuraru et al. 2015. So we also conducted the study in tropical region. That's for example. Uh, so we we collect our data actually by using a special instrument to to determine the level of isoprene and others uh, selected compound from 
sea surface uh, microlayer. And we also determine it by using uh, GCMS to collect, to determine the, the data uh, from, from the sea surface microlayer and the level of uh, BVOC in the atmosphere around the ocean. So this is our study. We, our, the result of our study, we found that the contraction of uh, isoprene, actually, the one that can produce uh, surface ozone, uh, dominated the contraction of other uh, BVOCs on the sea surface from, from coastal region in Malaysia. So this is the, the graph shows that the isoprene produce about 60%, 65% of overall uh, BVOC that we determine from, from the study area. So most of the time we find that the conversion of uh, BVOC is quite high in the upwelling area. So the upwelling intensity actually contribute to the amount of BVOCs in the, coastal, in the uh, tropical coastal region. So this is the, the uh, correlation between different parameters, for example, the monotropin and also isoprene. So the availing region of BBOC flux actually uh, range between 10 power of 7 and 10 power of 8 uh, molecule per centimeter square per second. And we found that the average plug actually in order of uh, isoprene, uh, beta pinene, alpha pinene, and limonene. This indicate that the level of uh, BBOCs can be produced from from a coastal region in, in especially in tropical areas such as in coastal region of uh, Malaysia. That's all for my presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Talib Latif. Um, I think we'll leave the question set for the end of the three talks. Uh, let me invite uh, the second speaker, uh, Professor Lisa Lotte uh, Tino from University of York. Uh, it's all yours. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Uh, I just wanted to point out I'm not lo no longer at the University of York. I'm now at IMT in the Hurlock. Um, and right, I'm, okay. a... I'm sorry about <laughs> that. But that's fine. That's absolutely fine. I was going to introduce that anyway. Um, so I'm going to talk about biogeochemical controls at the surface, and I'll take the example of marine ozone deposition. So uh, unlike um, Talib before me, I won't be looking so much as what to what is coming out of the ocean, but I'm going to look a bit how what is deposited at the surface of the ocean can be controlled um, from what is inside the ocean. Um, and so just to come back on the, oh, I see this is not the right version, um, but it's fine. Um, uh, yeah. So why, um, I'm gonna talk about ozone and more precisely about tropospheric ozone. And so it's probably good to look at um, why um, it's important to get this tropospheric ozone right. Um, this is not exactly the right um, presentation, but I, I'll, I hope it should be fine. Um, so um, tropospheric ozone is important, and I guess you all know it because it's uh, impacting air quality quite hugely. Um, it's very um, oxidative, so if you breathe it, it can cause asthma and all kinds of uh, respiratory um, problems. And it's um, uh, some studies have pointed out that it causes uh, 0.7 million global deaths annually, so it's quite an important uh, pollutant. It's also a powerful uh, greenhouse gas. Um, as I've written here, uh, the greenhouse warming potential. Oh, okay. Um, something happened. <laughs> I'm not sure what. Um, so I'll, <laughs> I'll just go back. Yeah, um, actually I wanted to start, this is probably the right talk coming up now. I'm sorry for this uh, moment of um, hesitation, but I wanted to start my talk just showing that actually I'm in France now and also to show it, uh, 
to show where I'm actually from. Um, I'm from the north of France because it, this is all virtual. So um, probably if we saw each other face to face, we would be able to discuss this in person. But as it's all virtual, I just wanted to point out I'm in the north of France. That's somewhere over here. Uh, we're very known for having lots of rain um, uh, in that region. But luckily for us, we also have good beer and fries, and uh, that's that's quite nice to comfort us. Um, this is the city I'm in right now, and I'm part of this laboratory, which is called Siri Energy and Environment, so the Department of Energy and Environment. And we work on sources and impacts of pollutants, reactivity, and indoor air uh, studies. Um, yeah, and then I'll go back to my slides, um, which are on the scientific side now. Um, I'm going to focus today on um, theme five, uh, as you all probably know by now, um, and we'll be covering a very tiny bit of this uh, core team. Um, there are three arrows that go up and down, um, and the one that is going down, one of the ones that is going down is the one on ozone, and it, you can see it's right next to the one that goes up for halogens, and this is where I'm going to talk about what I'm going to talk about now. Um, so I'm back to the air quality bit, um, so I've covered that. Um, ozone is a greenhouse gas, uh, as I've already mentioned, but it's also uh, very involved in, it's also very um, reactive chemical, and so it will influence the atmospheric chemistry a lot. It's the source of OH radicals that react that are the cleaners of the atmosphere, really. Um, and it's also a major uh, atmospheric oxidant, and this will have an impact on um, vegetation, and on agriculture. And in turn, um, if um, oxidation occurs on plants, we get a lower um, um, yield from, uh, for agriculture. And this also impacts the um, water uptake from the plants and also emissions from certain BOCs that can in, the, in turn uh, uh, impact greenhouse gas emissions. And so this is a, a feedback loop. So ozone is very, very important to get right. Uh, in our Earth system. And so um, if we look at ozone in the troposphere, uh, you have the very big molecule of ozone there. Uh, this is produced mainly through uh, photochemistry, uh, as you can see in the little cycle I've put there for uh, NOx and VOC uh, oxidation. And so we get production of ozone. And how can ozone move about? Well, it can be um, moving through transport in the atmosphere. It can go up and down. And one of the ways down is through deposition, uh, through surfaces uh, such as um, land surface, but also uh, ocean surfaces. And the whole game is to determine uh, where the ozone goes in the atmosphere and how much is produced. Um, and so to do that, we can use this kind of uh, uh, very simplistic model uh, I've put up here. We need to know all the sources. So it can come in from transport and it can be produced. We need to know all the sinks. There can be dry deposition of ozone. So to the surfaces, as I've mentioned before, uh, there can be vegetation surface, so land cover surfaces, water surfaces, and then there can be sinks that are uh, chemistry, can react away in the atmosphere, and it can be transported out of the parcel you're considering. And all that will give you the concentration of ozone at a certain, uh, at a certain time. Um, so to translate this in a little uh, equation, uh, we, if you want to know the, the ozone concentration at, at a certain time, you need to know the first term there uh, will be, well, the first two terms are about the transport of ozone uh, in and out, uh, up and down, and uh, in the three, three direction of the wind. And then the P uh, is the production of ozone in the atmosphere. L would be um, the loss rate, the chemical loss rate, and the last term, the position of ozone, okay? Um, so if you can solve this equation, then you know how much ozone you have at any point in the atmosphere at any time. Um, and if we assume there is no subsidence and no horizontal infection, we can simplify uh, the equation one, and then you can see that there, there comes in the flux term of ozone for the deposition, for the fluxes around of ozone, and also the deposition loss term, the last one. So it's important to get these two right uh, in order to determine ozone concentrations at the surface of the, uh, the, the Earth. And so if they do that in um, global uh, chemistry models or climate models, we get something with these kind of numbers. So in the troposphere, uh, we get uh, 300 teragram of ozone 
Some ozone comes down from the, the, from the stratosphere, about 500 teragram per year. Now we get 600 teragram per year that is deposited on land. And then we have 300 teragram per year that is deposited roughly um, on uh, water surfaces. But as you can see also that 300 uh, teragram per year that is deposited on uh, ocean surfaces has a very large uncertainty. It's 100% uncertainty. Okay, and so this is what we will focus on in this talk because some, some big progress has been made there. There's still lots of room for improvement, but I wanted to show a bit um, what has been done uh, lately in that, in that uh, area. And so um, if we talk about uh, ozone deposition, we need to know, know the ozone deposition velocity because that's gonna drive our loss of ozone at surfaces. And so conventionally, uh, ozone deposition velocities have been conceived like uh, is, uh, is shown here on this uh, schematic. Um, this has been conceived in the 70s from Wesley and Hicks. And so uh, basically uh, ozone deposition velocity, VD, is uh, the, the inverse of the sum of the resistances. So there is a turbulent atmosphere resistance, R1. Then there is the laminar resistance right at the surface of the, the this, this, right in the air side of the surface, uh, R2. And then there's R3, which is actually the surface resistance. And uh, for ozone, the surface resistance accounts for about 95% of the ozone deposition velocity. So this is gonna be a very um, important term to get right uh, if we wanna know uh, how ozone deposits on surface, on the ocean surface. And at the moment, no, until a couple of years ago, uh, this R3 model default value was about 2,200 seconds per meter, which gave a, gives us a um, deposition velocity of 0 0.04 centimeter per second. Okay. Um, and so um, if we compare a little, we can just take a little step back and look at the position fluxes over uh, land. Uh, this is what is shown here in this picture from, in this graph from Clifton et al. Uh, so we have long-term observations of ozone depositions. Uh, on, on this is all land uh, deposition. And you can see the number of sites with ozone fluxes measured throughout the time. So that means there is tens, of sites that are actually looking at ozone deposition fluxes since the 90s, okay? Uh, and this gives us uh, ozone deposition rates that are used in global models, and that can be uh, varied in different latitudes and in different times of the years, as you can see here uh, from the graph on the right hand side. Now, if we look at marine observations for ozone deposition, the deposition velocities are all listed here in this table. And uh, you can see immediately that actually we need to distinguish between seawater and freshwater deposition velocities. So that's uh, reducing a bit the, the number of uh, observations uh, available. And then we also want to probably take the ones that are the most reliable or comparable uh, um, uh, with, uh, with themselves um, because they all use eddy covariance. And so then you can see that actually we have three um, published um, observations at the moment for ozone deposition at the marine surface. That's not entirely correct. This was 20, uh, 2009. And since then, there's been some new observations and I'll come back to that in a bit. Um, if we go back to our uh, surface resistance, not quite right here. Um, yeah. Um, um, so they've been, they've managed to um, um, model um, with this default value of um, 0 0.045 centimeter per second, uh, some of the uh, ozone deposition velocities uh, worldwide. And so this is about what they get. Um, you can see there is a bit of an increase around the tropics um, for the uh, ozone deposition velocities. And the variation in that deposition velocity are mainly driven by air resistance differences, so air R1 and R2 uh, in this model. And so if we go back um, uh, to, our, to the observations that have been made for ozone deposition, you can see that actually 
uh, they are quite varied. You can see if you look well for the Gulf of Mexico, it's 0 0.056. And then in the coastal region of the North Sea, we're at 0 0.11. But for seawater of the Southern, uh, Southern California, it's 0 0.02. So there's quite a bit of uh, variance, but that's not taken into account in the model. And so we actually need better uh, measurements and to get the ozone better uh, in the models. And so that's what has been done. There's been some marine observation of ozone deposition. Um, there's other problems been with the observation because also lots was made in uh, coastal observation. So these are a few of the observations made by the Helmet Group uh, over the open ocean at covariance uh, for ozone deposition. And so um, actually what we're working with for ozone, as you can see, is very different from what we're working with for ozone over the land. Uh, land, we have lots of observations for, since a long time, and for marine deposition of ozone, there's only a few observations and um, huge uncertainty still there. Um, and so we're going to look at what we can do to improve that a little bit. Um, what has been done, uh, so here I'm showing uh, on the bottom some deposition velocities to see how important these deposition velocities are compared to land cover uh, deposition velocities. So uh, if you look, the WT deposition velocity is the deposition velocity in the models used at the moment, uh, some models used um, um, for water surfaces, and all the other ones are for land surfaces, so different types of land cover. And you can see that the deposition velocity over ocean is assumed to be very, very low, um, however, uh, and, and much higher over land. However, if we look at, um, at the top uh, that's ozone dry deposition, um, the, the number of, uh, like the, the mass of ozone that is deposited at the surface of the ocean. Um, that's actually very high compared to the land surfaces because we have such a large surface for, uh, for uh, deposition, even if the deposition velocities are quite low. And so um, um, small variation in oceanic uh, ozone deposition velocities lead actually to very large changes in total ozone deposition and surface ozone concentrations. And uh, for instance, the study of Ganseveld et al. in 2009 has shown that uh, if you change the um, um, deposition velocity from 0 0.01 to 0 0.05 centimeter per second, the surface ocean concentration goes down by 60%. So uh, as you've seen, we've got large uncertainty still. And so this will impact the uh, ozone concentration at the surface over the ocean very largely. Um, so um, we can ask ourselves also if we compare uh, ozone deposition to overseas and over land, you can clearly see that for ocean here at the bottom in the middle, um, the, the deposition velocity is supposed to be very stable. Um, whereas this is, might not be the case um, because there's very little observations. And for land, that certainly doesn't seem the case. Um, so we can ask ourselves, how stable is this ozone, ozone deposition over the ocean? And what is actually driving this process of ozone deposition? And so that brings us to my actual uh, biogeochemistry point uh, of this talk. Um, ozone deposit, what drives ozone deposition at the surface of the ocean? And so we do have some bits of answers there. Uh, one of the first things that actually drives ozone deposition at the surface of the ocean, so I'm talking dry ozone deposition, is iodide, and another one will be uh, organic uh, material at the surface of the ocean. And so let's talk about iodide a little bit. It's a very cool uh, element, um, as you will without a doubt understand from my talk. Um, so um, I have a schematic here that is from Carpenter uh, from last year. Um, and so, um, as you understand, there is ozone in, in the atmosphere, and there will be iodide, which is a mineral that is present in the ocean, such as uh, chloride and bromide, but at a much smaller um, concentration. And iodide at the surface of the ocean, I minus here, will react very quickly with ozone um, once it's dissolved in the water or once it's gone into the aqueous phase. And so when it's there, it will form HOI, as you can see on R1 on the right-hand side. And HOI will then further react to form uh, an equilibrium with I2. And I2 and HOI will be emitted in the gas phase. 
uh, as you can see on the schematic. Uh, the equilibrium between I minus and um, so iodide and iodate, which is IO3 minus, uh, is, is regulated in the ocean by uh, biological reduction, but also by chemistry and, and pH. And I'm not going to go into that aspect of the iodide chemistry at the moment, but it's also an important part uh, of research um, at the moment because we don't fully understand this. But so the reaction between iodide and ocean is uh, and uh, um, ozone is very fast. Uh, I've written down the uh, Kr uh, one there, so it's two ten to the uh, ninth per mole per second. So that's really diffusion limited. And so. Uh, in once this goes out, um, this form of um, iodide, so under the form of I2 and HOI, as you can see at the bottom of this uh, a bit busy uh, schedule, and I'm sorry, there's no pointer, so I can't lead you through. Um, but so you have I minus uh, the, uh, at the right at the bottom, it will react with ozone and form I2 and HOI. And once it's in the atmosphere, it will then initiate um, through photochemical uh, breakdown, it can in, uh, form I, uh, iodine radicals, which will react with ozone and can form even um, aerosols. And this will have a huge impact on um, atmospheric chemistry over the oceans. So it's quite important to uh, understand this part of the picture as well. And if you look at the numbers uh, coming out of the sea, so the green arrows at the bottom of this picture, uh, these are the fluxes that are estimated from modeling um, out of the ocean from, uh, for iodine uh, compounds. And you can see that the biggest numbers are actually the abiotic processes and not the biological processes as that was estimated uh, a little while ago. So um, we can assume nowadays that we assume now that the abiotic uh, processes for iodine are the main drivers for iodine chemistry in the atmosphere. Um, and so we need to know a little bit more of this iodide um, concentrations at the surface because they seem to be regulating really uh, ozone deposition and emissions of uh, iodine uh, compounds in the atmosphere. Um, and so the blue dots were all the observations of iodide that were made until 2014. And then there's some new data um, added to this climatology since 2014. And now we have a little bit of a better picture of the iodide concentrations at the surface of the ocean uh, in all the oceans of the world at the moment. But of course, we still uh, could do with some more data. Um, as these are all uh, snap, uh, snap picks. And then uh, we managed, to, well, um, Jan Sital published a new climatology, which showed um, uh, all the data, which compiled all the data that is available for iodide observations until now. And as you can see from this uh, graph, this is a concentration of iodide in the x-axis and then uh, probability density and the y-axis, that means how much, um, what concentrations of iodide are the most likely to be found at the surface of the ocean. And you can see the concentrations are generally very low. The largest concentrations are seen in coastal sites. That's the red line, as you can see from the zoom. Um, and concentrations are in the range of 100 nanomolar. So it's very tiny concentrations, but they will still drive the ozone deposition largely. Um, yeah. oh, sorry. And then um, there was another paper uh, from Sherwin et al, uh, which showed, uh, which used machine learning approach to actually um, model the surface, the expected iodide surface concentrations of the ocean. And these uh, concentrations, these model concentrations can then be used in uh, global models to um, model ozone deposition and ozone concentrations over the ocean. Uh, I won't go into too much detail here. Um, this would work, yeah. And we can come back now to our modeling approach um, or, or to our philo uh, deposition velocity. So we remember you have, we had this uh, deposition velocity scheme that was quite simplified. And now there's been a new approach uh, since Luhar 2018 and then Pound here uh, in 2020. They proposed a new scheme for uh, ozone deposition that's a bit more complex and a bit 
closer to reality, especially from the water side. So we, do, we, we used to have R1 and R2, and then the R3, which was the um, uh, just a one term. And now R3 is actually uh, uh, in three different layers, split in three different layers. So we'll have the reaction diffusion layer at the top, which is the first micrometers where ozone will diffuse into the turbulent layer uh, just below that, where we have some tur true turbulent mixing, we can have ozone and iodide go mixed down and there will still be reactions there and the products will uh, accumulate in these two layers. And then below that, we have the bulk ocean that is mainly seen as a reservoir for iodide, uh, which will supply iodide to the surface layers. And so this is the conceptual picture of models, the most recent models to um, uh, conceive the iodides uh, in the ocean for ozone deposition. We used to have this, remember this R3 uh, default value that was 0 0.045 centimeters per second. And now uh, for this R3, they've come up with a slightly more complex um, uh, equation to solve this uh, water resistance. Um, but um, I, I just want to point out that there is solubility taken into account. The uh, chemical reactivity of O3 is taken into account and also the diffusivity of O3 in the seawater. Uh, there's also um, a term that a different terms that account for the friction velocity and the thickness of the reaction diffusion layer. So if you're interested in this, uh, I would um, uh, advise you to read uh, these three papers that really explain this very well, uh, much better than I would, and I also don't have much time. Um, okay, so, but the, but the point is that it, the models have been greatly updated to take this iodide chemist, iodide ozone chemistry into account, and also, uh, take into account different concentrations of iodide because now we have more data on that. And so they've done this, and this is what it gives us. Um, if you look at the left, uh, the right hand side, the upper uh, picture there in purple is uh, the constant dry deposition. So that means they did the model and they used the constant deposition velocity for a dry deposition of ozone at the surface. And this is, uh, these are the deposition velocities they've observed from this model. So you can see the whole ocean is basically one box. There's some variations, but it's very um, uniform. And now they uh, can use uh, variable dry deposition. So taking into account differences in temperature at the uh, surface of the sea and taking into account difference, uh, different concentrations of iodide at the surface of the sea. And so that's what you see in B. Um, in the second um, model, glo uh, global uh, model there. And you can see that the deposition velocities largely um, are largely variable over the uh, surface oceans. And what you can see also is that in the high latitudes, we still have the highest deposition velocities. And this is mainly driven by the higher uh, uh, iodide concentration at the surface of the ocean there and the higher temperatures in the latitudes. And so uh, the bottom uh, plot shows the percent of change between the two approaches. Um, and on the left-hand side, you have um, the um, uh, deposition velocity, which they have compared with the uh, cruise tracks. So the deposition velocity is actually measured. So the measured ones are red, blue, green, purple, and yellow. Uh, the gray line you see at the top is when they use constant uh, deposition velocity approach. And then the black line is the current model uh, with the variable um, deposition velocity. And you can see there's, it's better. There's definitely still some, some improvement possible. Um, uh, and this is function of the temperature as I've, I've, said be I've mentioned before. So um, with all this iodine coming, out, iodine coming out of the ocean, we can also ask ourselves, um, is there any feedbacks of this system uh, due to uh, changes in our atmosphere since the pre-industrial times, for instance? And we know that ozone has greatly increased since the pre-industrial times because we've been emitting a lot more VOCs and NOxes. And so we know that ozone reacts with uh, I- in the seawater, and this leads to the uh, emission of reactive iodine species in the atmosphere. Um, and then this will 
have an impact on surface ozone again because the, uh, the species that are emitted are actually uh, destroying ozone in the atmosphere. And so people have uh, asked themselves since pre-industrial time, what is uh, when the uh, is there any feedback of this system? And so Prados and Roman have been looking at this, and they've actually considered uh, they've modeled uh, changes in uh, the ozone observed since pre-industrial time, and then they've compared this uh, over time. And this is uh, what you see in this picture. This is the delta uh, I Y. So IOI is the sum of all the species you see at the bottom. So all the reactive iodide species that are iodine species that are emitted in the atmosphere. And they've looked at how much more is emitted since pre-industrial times. And as you can see, there's quite a difference uh, and it's only a positive difference. So that means there's much more iodine emitted uh, since pre-industrial time. And that's driven by this increase of ozone. And they've actually also been able to confirm this in ice cores, and which is very interesting, I, I thought, um, and I wanted to share this with you. So this is the Le Grand et al. Uh, study where they've been looking at ice cores from uh, Dom, uh, I, I can't remember the exact place anymore, but somewhere in France, uh, where they've done uh, carotting of ice and the, the bottom figure there shows all the observations they've done of uh, iodine in the uh, snow cover. And as you can see very clearly, iodine species have gone up very clearly since uh, the 1900s, and that's trapped in the ice core. And so at the top there also, you can see the total um, iodine in nanogram per gram of snow. And you can see there also from 1930 to uh, 1995, it's been a very clear uh, increase of iodine species uh, trapped in the snow. So this is a very nice example of how uh, the feedback, there can be some feedback of um, natural systems due to our uh, climate, well, not climate change, but increased pollutants in the atmosphere and uh, how we can actually go about confirming this with observations. I don't have very much time left. Uh, yeah, so this is just to conclude uh, that they have seen in this, um, uh, um, modeling study that when we increase ozone by 40%, we actually get 45% more iodine emissions, but there's also 25, this also will contribute to some uh, bigger ozone losses. So there's a negative feedback between ozone pollution and oceanic iodine emissions. I really wanted to talk very quickly about um, what else drives uh, iodine emissions. Um, but maybe, uh, yeah. I've got only one minute remaining and I just want to skip very quickly through um, some slides. I'm not going to talk very much about it. I'm sorry, I, I probably lost some time in the beginning. Um, yeah, so I want to come to this picture that probably uh, resumes a little bit um, what I wanted to talk about. So uh, I think in earlier this week, you've been talking about uh, surface microlayer and also how this can impact uh, formation of uh, aerosols. But this can also impact gas, uh, air gas exchange, uh, air sea exchanges. And this is just a picture to show that uh, there's been a study doing some experiments with uh, surface microlayer and uh, ozone deposition uh, on that, and looking at uh, I2 emissions from the reaction of ozone with I minus in the seawater. And what you can see here in black, uh, the black dots are uh, Ki solutions, so just an artificial Ki solution. Then the red dots is artificial seawater, that means pH adjusted uh, Ki solution. And then the blue dots are surface, uh, surface seawater. And in green, you can see the uh, SML. So that's the sample of surface microlayer they've taken. And uh, they've flown ozone over that. And they can actually see a decrease in emissions of I2 when using the surface microlayer. And this is, these are real samples they've used. And so we can actually see there is a, a very important reduction of I2 emissions um, when you over the surface microlayer, which probably indicates that there's something going on we don't quite understand yet. That's been explained through a uh, change in solubility of I2 in the surface microlayer, but a lot more investigation uh, need, is needed there to understand these um, uh, processes a little bit better. And uh, with this last example of how, uh, how biogeochemical controls um, uh, or 
uh, or ruling the pose on that position, I will leave you. Um, so with this uh, final slide, with a conclusion, so we've seen that measurements of ozone deposition over the open ocean, and there's a new climatology of iodide concentrations, which have lead, led to new model developments for ozone deposition, but there's still lots of room for improvement. Uh, there's an uncertainty in the I minus plus O3 rate in function of the temperature. There's uh, a lot of uncertainty between uh, four reactions of ozone with the DOC, and especially for the role of the SML uh, surface microlayer in, in this whole system. And I wanted to leave you also uh, at the end with a small bibliography for people who are very motivated. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Tino. I think it's, uh, 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 Professor Tino provides a, a, a whole world of the information that was very excellent. I'm sure there is a lot of questions come back at the QA session. So again, thank you. Um, I'd like to invite uh, the third speaker, uh, Professor Anoop Mahajan, and uh, from uh, the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, and uh, he will be talking about LC interaction over the Indian Ocean. Anoop, please, it's all yours. Thank you, Manan. Uh, it's very nice to finally uh, interact with some students uh, at the Solar wow. Summer School. Uh, and I hope most of you will be there in person in Cape Verde next year when the summer school happens. Uh, so my job has been made significantly easier by, uh, by Talib and by Lizalet because they've covered uh, the importance of, uh, of these emissions from the oceans uh, and what kind of uh, impact they have on the atmosphere. So during this talk, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about the Indian Ocean. So, uh, and I'm hoping that by the end of this uh, presentation, uh, you will be able to uh, understand why the Indian Ocean is important. The second thing is why the science in, in the Indian Ocean is exciting. So especially if you want to do studies for the future, it's a really good region to focus on. And also uh, try and make sure that you understand that the changes that are happening in the Indian Ocean are significant. And in fact, we are seeing certain changes before the other oceans see it. So it's a very good place to go and do studies now to understand what's going to happen in the other oceans in the future also. And uh, also one of the reasons for this is uh, because it is one of the least sampled uh, oceans in the, in the world. In fact, Lizalet earlier showed a plot of iodide observations and there were lots of observations in the Pacific, Atlantic, and there were none in the Indian Ocean until we went and made observations with, uh, with Lizalet uh, a couple of years ago. So even though we know that there are significant changes happening, it is still one of the least sampled oceans in the world. So there's a lot of exciting science to do over there, and hopefully you guys will be able to, to, the, uh, to contribute in the future. So let me start off uh, by say, uh, saying that most of the observations we tend to do in the Indian Ocean are on ships. Uh, and uh, uh, what we do is we send, uh, we go on these ships on, on vessels like these and make observations in different parts of the Indian Oceans. And of course, we also rely on remote sensing observations. Unfortunately, the number of uh, ship-based campaigns that happen in the, in the Indian Ocean are much less than in the, in the Atlantic or Pacific, which is one of the reasons why it is very, uh, it's not sampled very heavily. So if you are interested in doing some sampling, uh, there are a couple of ways which uh, you as students can also participate in cruises. Uh, and uh, you can contact me separately. Uh, my email address is over here. And you can contact me uh, separately if you are interested in participating in cruises uh, over the next few years uh, during your PhDs. With that, let me start getting into the science itself. Uh, uh, so we've already seen this, uh, the different SOLAS themes. You have your different core themes, and right now we are talking mainly about core, the, the fifth theme. However, uh, the Indian Ocean is also, uh, uh, the Indian Ocean is uh, being designated as a high sensitivity system within SOLAS. And uh, it's the, one of the reasons for that is to encourage people to do more science in the Indian Ocean, as I said, because it's very, very, it's the least sampled ocean amongst the larger oceans. And, and also because this high sensitivity system includes uh, science from all the different themes, 
uh, we need all different types of solar scientists to contribute to it. And uh, this is a big push that is happening from SOLAS uh, to try and encourage this kind of work. And why that is, is uh, something that we'll talk about during this, this presentation. The Indian Ocean is very special in the sense of the interactions it has with the atmosphere. And one of the main reasons for that is uh, most of you must have heard about the Asian summer monsoon or the Indian summer monsoon. And what happens during the monsoon period is we get a complete change in the way air masses uh, uh, travel over the Indian Ocean. Through the most of the year, uh, the air masses are actually going from the continental side towards the ocean side. Right, so basically you're going from uh, from the the continent where you have your sources, uh, anthropogenic sources, for example. So you have your pollutants, etc. They are all being put into the Indian Ocean itself. Uh, however, during the monsoon period, what happens is the intertropical convergence zone it moves up towards the north, and then what happens is your your oceanic air masses, the clean air, essentially starts coming into the continent. So as you can imagine, uh, from a solar perspective, this is very exciting because what you have is you have certain periods when you have uh, increased pollutants over the ocean, you have more deposition, uh, you have uh, more influence of the continent on the oceans. And then the other periods during the summer monsoon, you have a completely different regime where you have reduced pollutants because you have cleaner air masses and you have more influence of the clean marine airflow on the continents rather than the continents on the, on the oceans. So because of this, you have two different regimes and these two different regimes lead to a lot of different SE interactions, uh, changing the biogeochemistry of the ocean itself, changing the type of gases that are coming out of the ocean, uh, changing the amount of these gases coming out of the ocean. So it has a lot of different interactions. This is a, a very simple schematic that we put together for a paper that has just come out this year. It's a really nice overview paper talking about the atmospheric composition over the Indian Ocean. So if you're interested in, in understanding a little bit more about the atmospheric composition, I would suggest that you go and read this paper. It's by Susan Tegmeyer, uh, and it's out in ACP this year itself. And uh, quite a few of solar scientists, including uh, Krista Marandino, whom you all know, who is uh, helping organize this uh, summer school, is also a co-author on it. And uh, it gives you a nice overview of the kind of changes we are seeing in terms of the oceanic trace gases and uh, continental trace gases over the Indian Ocean. Uh, with that, uh, the main reason, as I said, is because uh, what happens is the ITCC, which is the Intertropical Conversion Zone, it moves up north during the monsoon period, and hence you have completely different air masses. Now, this uh, figure shows you the change in air masses. Uh, unfortunately, the arrows are not very clear, but hopefully you can see the arrowheads at least. And what you see is in panel number A and B, there is a complete difference in how the air masses uh, uh, move. So, for example, during the summer monsoon, which is during June, July, August, on the left hand side uh, top plot, you have a very strong influence of oceanic air masses on the continent. And you can see that's mainly because the pressure is lower and in, in, in over the continents as compared to over the oceans and hence the air masses are going to move northwards. However, during the winter monsoon or even during the transition periods, air masses are very different. During winter monsoon, what you end up getting is you get your continental air masses moving down south and and uh, uh, and hence all the pollutants, et cetera, move down south. And then you have these two transitional periods where things are in between. There's no, no clear uh, direction of air masses, uh, but still there is a stronger influence of continent on the ocean as compared to the ocean on the continent itself, which of course means deposition is going to change considerably. Uh, we, this is about the atmosphere. We should also think about what's happening over the ocean itself. Uh, the ocean, Indian Ocean, uh, the, uh, the ocean also has a lot of different types of currents, and because of the way the winds move, you also get changes in the uh, in the oceanic air mass, uh, in in the oceanic water masses, and how the currents are functioning. The Indian Ocean is pretty complex. Uh, it is it's uh, basically got continents on the north, and then it's connected to the other oceans through the Southern Ocean on the down south. So the actual exchange in water masses happens much further the down south. Up north, uh, what you have is a lot of influence of river, uh, river inputs, etc. And also a lot of uh, upwelling water masses, which bring in a lot of nutrients, which affects biogeochemistry quite uh, drastically in this region. And as you can see, there's a lot of uh, different types of uh, currents over here. To the north, so if you look at panel number C, to the north of it, you can see that the chlorophyll concentrations are pretty high, uh, very close to the coast of Oman and, and, uh, and Pakistan and India. 
and that's because these currents are bringing up nutrients over there so during certain periods of the year especially during january and all you get very strong upwelling systems and hence you get a lot of up, a lot of productivity in this part of the world whereas during the summer monsoon as the as currents become much much weaker uh, what you end up getting is you get very low productivity in the same regions although there is an upwelling uh, system close to the coast of oman which continuously pr brings in uh, nutrients for the chlorophyll or phytoplankton to survive but not just uh, the point of this figure is it's not just atmospheric but also oceanic uh, air water masses also show, show significant changes and these are not very well characterized in terms of the impacts they have the other reason to worry about the Indian Ocean, uh, even now, is because the kind of changes we are seeing there. Now, all of you must have heard that the Arctic Ocean is the fastest warming ocean in the world, and that is very much true. But besides the Arctic, uh, the next ocean which is warming very rapidly is the Indian Ocean. So what we are seeing is not just uh, these interannual, uh, sort of intra-annual changes, but we are also seeing these inter-annual changes because of climate change uh, in, in the Indian Ocean. And this is quite noticeable. So if you look at the SST anomaly, which is on the bottom, you can see the Indian Ocean has already warmed by uh, as much as uh, sorry, as much as 0.8 uh, or 0.9 uh, degrees, which is much higher than any other ocean. And uh, you can see that there are certain areas of the Indian Ocean which are warming faster than the others. And there's a lot of interest in physical oceanography to try and understand what is driving these changes. And if you look at the future, this is just going to keep on getting worse. Uh, so these are some simulations that were done to try and understand what will happen to the Indian Ocean surf sea surface temperature if under the different RCP scenarios. And as you can see, the, there's going to be constant warming, which is over and above what has actually been seen right now. And uh, of course, if we continue warming up according to RCP 8.5, then we are going to see some very drastic changes. And remember, these changes are not just physical because any changes in the temperature, etc., of course, is going to affect your biogeochemistry itself. Uh, but before I get into the biogeochemistry or the impacts on biogeochemistry that we are observ uh, observing, uh, here's another plot showing the change, uh, the, the big change that's happening. So what you see over here is uh, the ocean heat content. So it's the total amount of energy in the in the oceans. And uh, we know that most of the energy, the, the warming that has happened in, on this planet has actually been taken up by the oceans as compared to the atmosphere. So the oceans are really helping buffer climate change or at least atmospheric temperatures. Unfortunately, that also means that the oceans are heating up. And on the top panel, what you see is the global ocean heat content, which as you can see is increasing continuously. But on, in the Indian Ocean, we have seen something very interesting, and it's a bit different from the other oceans. What we saw was there wasn't much of an increase until about 1995. There was a small trend. And then there was a decrease in the ocean heat content, after which there has been a drastic increase, much more rapid than the average global uh, ocean heat increase. So, so uh, the, the rate in ocean heat uh, content. So basically, the Indian Ocean is now one of the most rapidly changing oceans uh, in the world. And this is a matter of concern because that's going to, as I said, have effects on biogeochemistry, etc. So what kind of effects are we looking on uh, biogeochemistry? This was a paper by Roxy Cole, uh, which was uh, came out in GRL in 2015, talking about the difference that we are seeing in terms of the biogeochemistry, in terms of uh, the productivity. So what, what uh, they basically did was they tried to understand the change in chlorophyll and uh, the, the purple colors in the chlorophyll on the left-hand side plots is basically a decrease in chlorophyll. So basically, your primary productivity is showing a decrease. And on the right hand side, you have the SSDs, right? So as you can see, they ran, ran different uh, uh, models and uh, created ensemble means, etc. And what you can see is, yes, the SSD is increasing. Uh, they did a run from 1950 to about 2005 uh, for the ensemble. And what you can see is, yes, there is a definite increase in the SSD. Certain parts of the Indian Ocean are actually seeing a more rapid increase, uh, which we know through observations is also correct. And that is having implications on the productivity. So your chlorophyll concentrations, especially in the upwelling regions, is actually showing a decrease because of the rapid warming that is being seen in the oceans. Now, this is obviously a matter of grave concern because uh, what you uh, what we are seeing is the ocean is becoming less productive. It, productive, so uh, obviously its uh, ability to capture more carbon, etc., is also going to 
going, going to reduce. And the reason for that is, is it's basically physical oceanography affecting chemical oceanography uh, affecting biology. So these, uh, these uh, series of plots essentially show the change in your nutrient concentrations because of a change in your SSD, which is you know, changing your currents, etc. And that's basically through your static stat stability. So your nitrate, phosphate, silicate, all of them are showing a decrease uh, over this uh, period of model run, and which is, of course, affecting your chlorophyll concentration. So it's it's, it's a uh, continuous process through which you are seeing changes. Now, this is about changes, but besides that, we have a lot of interesting uh, work happening on, on other uh, types of gases that we have seen. I won't talk about halogens uh, a lot because Lizard has already covered quite a bit, but let's talk about things like DMS and isoprene, which basically, as Minhan said, are very important for atmospheric chemistry because they affect the number of clouds that are being formed. So radiatively, they are very, very critical. They're climatically sensitive trace gases. And as you can see, the Indian Ocean is also a bit of a hot spot for emissions of dimethyl sulfide. So uh, besides the Southern Ocean, which is by far one of the largest emission sources for uh, dimethyl sulfide and has the largest impacts, the Indian Ocean is actually uh, one of the, uh, uh, is, is actually a hotspot for DMS emissions. And that also changes according to the periods. During the summer monsoon, you end up getting quite large emissions, not just in the equatorial, uh, sorry, it's south of the equatorial Indian Ocean, but also up in the North Indian Ocean. And uh, these uh, so these numbers are very high. They're comparable to certain places in the Southern Ocean also. So these are very uh, significant emissions. Uh, in the winter summer monsoon, uh, you get lower emissions, uh, sorry, in the winter monsoon, not winter summer monsoon. In the winter monsoon during de in December, January, February, you get lower emissions in the north of the Indian Ocean, but much more it's further down south of the Indian Ocean. And of course, during the transitional periods, you have changes uh, depending on the wind speeds. So most of this emission, of course, there is a slight increase in terms of the uh, seawater DMS concentrations, but this high emission is being driven by wind rather than the actual concentration of DMS itself. So as the winds, uh, wind speeds, etc. are changing with climate change, we expect significant changes in DMS emissions also. If we look at isoprene, we see a, a fairly similar structure except during the winter's, uh, winter monsoon. Uh, isoprene obviously is much more, um, uh, the emissions are much more in coastal regions and also in the high productive regions like the Gulf of Oman, etc., where you have these uh, upwelling systems which are leading to higher productivity. So you can see pretty large emissions of isoprene, which again can, uh, can lead to formation of OVOCs and can contribute to new particle formation in the atmosphere. They are also pretty large in the Indian Ocean during the uh, monsoon period. Besides, that, uh, besides these two ones, we can also think about uh, some of the anthropogenic emissions. Now, one thing we spoke about was how uh, there is a complete transition between the summer monsoon and winter monsoon, where you get uh, these and, and the air masses coming from the continent or to over the ocean and vice versa. So basically what happens is, uh, since we have uh, anthropogenic emissions are mostly located on continents, there are of course uh, emissions such as ships, etc. But uh, total quantity wise, your continental emissions are much, much larger. So what will happen is you will have very clean air masses during the mo summer monsoon period where you don't have very strong and continental inputs into the Indian Ocean. However, after the summer monsoon is done, you end up getting a lot of continental emissions going down into the Indian Ocean. So during these periods, uh, besides the summer monsoon, what you end up getting is a lot of uh, inputs of things like uh, carbon monoxide, methane, ozone, we'll look at those plots also. But these chemicals end up getting transported down into the uh, clean marine environment. A flip side about this is during the summer period, you get very clean air masses coming over the continents. So for example, everybody knows that places in India are extremely polluted. We have a lot of particulate pollution, even over China, there's a lot of particulate pollution with, uh, uh, ha happening because of biomass burning, because of coal burning, etc. So during the summer monsoon period, it actually acts as a, uh, as a vacuum cleaner. So you get a lot of clean air and during that period the air quality is significantly better over the continents. Now this has implications on billions of people because most of the countries along the Indian Ocean Rim are heavily populated. So during this this has implications in terms of air quality that these people are exposed to. So during the summer monsoon of course air quality is much better but the rest of the time we are actually putting in much more polluted air masses into the Indian Ocean which of course will interact as, uh, as Liz Alert was pointing 
pointing out with the ocean surface and change the kind of chemicals that are coming out of the ocean surface itself. So this is for ozone, uh, sorry, for carbon monoxide. And this next one is for methane. Now, methane has a much longer lifetime. So you, uh, you know that uh, it's going to survive a little more further down south as compared to carbon monoxide. And of course, because its lifetime is about 10 years or so, you have a very strong interhemispheric divide uh, between the two. And you can see that, that uh, pretty clearly that even during the winter monsoon, when you have strong emissions, uh, sorry, strong inputs from, from the continents coming in, they do not really cross the ITCC and go down further, further down south. But up north, you can see a very big difference in methane concentrations between the summer monsoon and the winter monsoon period, where the ocean side especially shows very low concentrations at, or comparatively low concentrations during the summer monsoon because there are no continental inputs or very few continental inputs going into the ocean, whereas during the winter monsoon, your methane concentrations increase drastically over the ocean region. Now, uh, considering you know or you have been uh, listening to lectures about the chemistry, you know this has pretty large implications on the oxidizing capacity uh, because it's going to react with all OH radicals. It's going to lead to increase in ozone concentrations, etc. So the continental emissions of anthropogenic species also has pretty large implications over the uh, Indian Ocean during certain periods. Now, this uh, figure is about the ozone concentrations. Uh, now, Lizalit was talking about how important ozone is in terms of its tropospheric chemistry itself and how uh, it can react with the ocean surface, leading to emissions of uh, sensitive uh, compounds such as iodine species, which forms a very strong feedback loop. Now, this is a study that we had done to try and understand how much ozone is actually going to survive over the ocean uh, region. And as you can see, we did the studies during January, April, and July because we had observations over the ocean during that period. And what you can see is, yes, during the winter monsoon, which is January, uh, you get a very high concentration of ozone over the uh, Indian Ocean region. Now, ironically, during this period, what will happen is uh, because there is more ozone, that will deposit and lead to a, a, a larger emission of iodine compounds. So. In fact, ocean emissions are much more active during the winter monsoon period, at least anthropogenically driven ocean em emissions are very active during the, uh, during the mon uh, winter monsoon period. But in the summer monsoon period, because all your clean air is coming from the oceans and going over the Indian, uh, in, Indian continent, what you end up having is much more cleaner environments, which actually reduces the emissions that are coming out of the Indian Ocean region. So this is a very interesting feedback cycle between the anthropogenic emissions and the oceanic emission. And I must say that although we have some data for this, uh, we still are, do not have enough observations to get a complete picture. For example, we don't know what happens to most of the other emissions. So we have some idea about halocarbons, we have some idea about DMS, we have some idea about isoprene, but we do not have an idea about what's happening uh, further down deep into the uh, Indian Ocean during the monsoon period, especially, mainly because making observations during the monsoon period is, is pretty difficult logistically. As you can imagine, you don't want to be in the middle of the sea during a storm. So these are kind of observations which we are really looking for. And if you are interested in Indian Ocean science, then this is definitely the right time to get into it. Because as I said, it's, we don't have enough observations. With that, I'll, uh, I'll stop over here. I'm hoping that you'll, uh, you've got a good idea of, uh, you know, why this region is important and what kind of data we have. The only thing that I would like to add to this is, uh, sorry, yes. So, uh, SOLAS has a, a a cross-cutting theme on the Indian Ocean. And uh, we have identified certain priority regions that we need to address. I'm sure most of you being future solar scientists or even current and future solar scientists uh, are going to contribute to this uh, theme quite a lot. The main priority areas which we have uh, identified right now are to understand what the na natural variability of the biogeochemical cycles, ecosystems, and atmospheric chemistry is over the Indian Ocean. Uh, what is the effect of long-range transport of air pollution? As I said, there's a huge change in air masses which happens over the Indian Ocean. We do not really understand total implications of this as yet. So there's a lot of exciting science to be done on this because there's a very strong feedback cycle, uh, which is the point number three, uh, because we really need to understand how human-induced stressors are impacting biogeochemistry chemistry and ecosystems on, of the Indian Ocean. We have some ideas that, yes, there is a strong impact. For example, this was talking about the ocean, uh, sorry, the ozone deposition and emission of iodine. Uh, we need to understand 
understand similar cycles on the on the other uh, compounds which are being emitted and finally how are these affecting human populations because finally uh, the kind of air masses that uh, are over the indian ocean do get transported to over the continents and we need to understand what kind of impacts they will have on the human populations around the indian ocean rim region so hopefully you guys will be contributing to this in the future and with that i will stop and uh, hand it back to minhan thank you Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Anouf. It's a very comprehensive and uh, informative uh, uh, on the Indian LC interaction. Um, it's a quite exciting uh, ongoing there. We are running a little bit behind the schedule, but I think it's fine. And uh, if Pope Talif is still there. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> All right, okay, that's wonderful. Um, now we are getting to the QA session. And uh, again, I encourage all the students the training to put your video on so we, we can be better interactive, all right? Any question, please raise your hand. And uh, I, I stop just uh, try to ask one of the first question to a note because we are you have been showing there is a dramatic change of the of the SST and over the Indian Ocean. Is there any study try to decompose the, 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 the major driver for this uh, for this uh, 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 warming for the last 40 or, or 50 years? Yeah, so th there have been lots of studies trying to understand why this warming trend is being seen and, and why is it much more than over the other oceans, for example. Uh, there are good reasons for that. Uh, the main reason is the way the currents work over the Indian Ocean. So as I said, the exchange in water masses is not as strong as compared to the other oceans. Uh, so the water mass gets trapped in the Indian Ocean and that Jaya region especially is seeing a very strong, uh, strong increase. In fact, uh, Krista, you have also done some studies studies on, on the SST, is that right? Uh, when, when you guys were doing some campaigns? On SST, I did not. Uh, okay. But, sorry. <laughs> All right. Yeah, but basically yeah. the drivers, are, is, it's phys physical oceanography explains why this increase is happening. The absorption of heat is, is happening in all oceans, of course, but the, the, the way the water currents work leads to trapping of the water masses and, and, and that heat content is trapped in that region. Yeah, by my observation, it looks like upwardly it's a it's a it's a weakening. Looks like if you it's quite consistent with the phosphor and nutrient concentration decline, something like that. I, I don't know. Just uh, I'm not yeah. uh, uh, in this field. Sure. Yeah. No, that is oh, true. Anyway, but... I, I I see the students raise their hand. Yao Hua Luo, please raise your questions. Uh, thank you. Very wonderful talks. Uh, just a small question to. Uh, Professor Pali, uh, you just mentioned that uh, the the relationship between uh, hydrocarbon and the, the biological activities in coastal ocean. But I'm curious about that. Uh, how to distinguish the hydrocarbon directly come from the anthropogenic activities in the coastal ocean and that produced from biological activities? Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh... Um, so far, actually, our group study is based on the uh, biogenic activities or biogenic uh, sources. But we also found that the anthropogenic influence also contribute to the amount of halocarbon. For example, in the coastal area near to the uh, urban area, for example, or, or uh, marine estuaries, uh, river estuaries, the level of uh, halocarbon is quite high. So uh, we believe that this actually contribute by anthropogenic activities. But so far, we cannot differentiate between uh, the different between uh, anthropogenic and also uh, natural uh, uh, emissions. So uh, for, for isoprene, actually, we conducted our research far from the coastal area because we want to, to see the level of isoprene coming from uh, outwelling uh, processes by natural uh, emissions. So um, I think we need to have uh, more study on, on this kind of uh, experiment 
to uh, differentiate between anthropogenic and natural emission? If I can just complement that, uh, uh, like one way to look at differentiating anthropogenic and, and uh, bio, biological emissions could be also looking at uh, trends. So uh, if it's biological, you'll see usually a diurnal trend or a tidal trend, um, because uh, algae would emit more when they are exposed, for instance, to a, a drier situation. So when they get, uh, when the sea is retre uh, retreating, uh, they would emit the most um, halo carbons, for instance. So that, that could be one way to look at uh, uh, distinguishing the biological from the anthropogenic, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. So, Yao Hua, are you happy with the answer? Yeah. Ah, okay, so uh, thank you. Uh, for the follow-up uh, uh, student who asked question, please identify, your, uh, identify yourself so we can better connect it and uh, uh, know each other. So I see Han Xiong is reading your piece. Uh, uh, hi, uh, my name is Hashan. Uh, uh, I'm from University of Southampton, United Kingdom. I'm, I'm a PhD student at National Ocean Center in Southampton. So I have a question to Anu. Uh, you are saying like in winter monsoon, uh, Northern uh, Indian Ocean becomes more biologically productive and in Southern Indian Ocean is less biologically productive. So does this mean that the Northern Indian Ocean becomes CO2 sink in winter monsoon and Southern Indian Ocean CO2 soils uh, in winter monsoon? And does this oscillate between monsoon? Does this phenomenon oscillate between monsoon? That's a very good question. Uh, there, is, there have been quite a few studies on carbon dioxide uh, sources and sinks over the Indian Ocean, and I can see Krista is smoking away. I think uh, maybe Krista is the right person to address this because she's done a lot of work on, on, on this in, in the Indian Ocean. I mean, I would argue that I am not the best person to answer this in terms of the world, but I can say a little bit. So the, the, um, the actual observations of the source or sink in the Indian Ocean are very, very few. And actually, one thing that we uh, we realized during writing this review that um, Anup mentioned is that in the, within the SOPAT database, that observations in the Indian Ocean actually decreased in the last decade. So it's actually quite, quite um, is the word alarming? So a little bit alarming to see that there was a nice trend of observations in the Indian Ocean, and then suddenly it just turned around. And so now, as Anup also mentioned, we really urgently need more um, observations of the carbon cycle in the Indian Ocean. But there are differences between the Northern and the Southern Indian Oceans. And I think um, it, it, it could be, as you say it, Kashan, uh, but I think we, we lack the observations to really definitively say. And even, for example, what's published in the Bay of Bengal is not, is not clear. And this was a, a contentious issue during this writing of the review that it's really spot measurements within the Bay of Bengal. So it's even hard to summarize if the Bay of Bengal is a source or a sink of CO2 to the atmosphere in the different seasons. So long story short, eh. <laughs> I don't know the answer. Yeah, so you were saying like, we don't have much observation. So, so then the next question is how we get the more data. <laughs> So, yes. like, go, go on cruises with so the Indian people. Ocean countries like <laughs> Sri Lanka, India. So, we are like behind the interest, I mean, the facility in terms of facilities or the funds. I'm not like compared to the other countries like Europe. Yeah. No, that's so a maybe. very that, that's a very good point, uh, Hashan. Uh, so, getting continuous observations is a bit of a challenge, uh, mainly yeah. because. Uh, in the Northern Indian Ocean, especially, uh, there isn't even one single continuous monitoring station. Like uh, in the Southern Indian Ocean, you have the Amsterdam Islands or even Equatorial, you have Reunion Islands where you can get a continuous uh, series, uh, time series. In the Northern Indian Ocean, still there isn't. There, are, there have been steps taken in the last couple of years to start setting it up. Unfortunately, it's a bit of a process, but we are hoping that from next year on, we'll have a long-term uh, monitoring station over there. In addition to that, there are some cruises which have been taking place 
uh, over the last few years, which is going to increase the number, uh, amount of data that we have. However, th those are still not analyzed and published. Uh, the groups are taking their time, unfortunately. But yes, uh, as, as Krista mentioned, uh, if you are interested in this, uh, you're more than welcome to come and join some of our cruises because the idea is to get more people involved to increase the amount of data available. But, and to answer your first question, there so a couple of studies by uh, th this, this person called Vinu Valsala, he's done some pretty interesting modeling based uh, studies. He's based at IITM. And it does show that you do see this asymmetry in uh, carbon sources and sink. However, as Krista said, there isn't enough data to back it up. Uh, but yes, that there, there are hints that uh, there will be asymmetry in terms of the seasons and in, in it being a source or a sink. Yeah, that's very fruitful uh, uh, for discussion. I think it's uh, quite uh, uh, considerable if we can launch a time series station at the Indian Ocean, in particular this, the, the, the Jai area. So, uh, it's a mimic with the, the Bermuda and the Aloha station. That could be something uh, international effort as well. So India Ocean is an a, a, a area of opportunity for all the young, young generations. Thank you. Uh, I see uh, Yuan Xu Dong uh, from uh, East Nigeria. It's all yours. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, very great talks. Uh, I'm Yuan Xu Dong from the University of East Anglia and a PhD student uh, working with Darcy Park and Peter Lee. So I have a question to Professor Tino. Um, so for, for example, when we talk about the CO2 flux, we use the gas transfer velocity. Uh, multiply the ASA CO2 fuel gas difference to calculate the flux. So when we talk about the ozone uh, flux, which K, which gas transfer velocity we have been used? I mean, for the CO2, we use like the one you have one. Uh, so which one for the ozone has been used? Yeah, that's a good question. And I'm not the best person to answer that question, I'm afraid. Um, I've been looking at this actually this morning and I can't, can't really find, I couldn't find it straight away. I'm not a flux person, so this is not my area of expertise, but I, um, I'm sure you can find it in all the references I've listed in the, um, um, in the modeling, because I've only looked at this from a model, like from the model papers and I'm, um, I'm not very, very familiar with the, the flux measurements in themselves. I don't know, uh, Krista, if you have, yeah, I would make, so it's more a deposition velocity and not a K, right? So not the same kind of K. So you definitely have to look it up in the in the papers that Ms. Lotta put in, into her uh, reference list. And a lot of times it's measured directly. So it's nothing like Wannacop or something like that. It's, yeah, it's, it's not like, a gas exchange uh, with mm -hmm. the uh, mm. uh, velocity flux. And it's a deposition, it's actually, a uh, top-down measure, a uh, top-down uh, deviation, the calculation. So you 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 calculate the, the three-dimensional transport and the yeah. production, and then the, the loss. So you you come up with the the net one would be the deposition. That's the pretty much a, what I understand. That's uh, quite... actually yeah. Go ahead. So, sorry. So it's quite different yeah. with the CO two or like BMS. It's, it's different, the deposition flux is different. Okay, mm -hmm. right. thank you. All right, correct. Um, actually, I have a, because we are, we are facing a, a quite a, a common feature for all this lack of measurement and uh, ozone is one of them actually. Uh, 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 Lisa Roti, do you have, I'm not in this field, but do we have, uh, why are they using the satellite? for measurement the, the, the observed the ozone, no? Well, you can, you can oh. use satellite observations for ozone, but you won't get the flux. And, and what we really need is more measurements on the deposition velocities in, in different areas. And uh, not only the deposition velocity, but also from the seaside, looking at what is driving this deposition, because that's the link between the two is really missing. Because uh, ozone is not very soluble, so it won't go into the ocean unless there is something driving it into the ocean and reacting very quickly. So the postulate has been that it's iodide, but we've seen that, especially in the Indian Ocean, for instance, um, when we model this, uh, the observations of IO in the gas phase do not necessarily line up very well 
with what we've uh, observed, what, what we can model for from the from, from our understanding of the chemistry at the moment. So there, there's definitely links missing there and things that we don't get very right yet. And of course, you want to compliment. Yeah, if I can just add on to that, Minan, uh, the, the pro satellite products for tropospheric, especially brown boundary layer ozone, are not very good because they're just not sensitive towards it. Uh, because most of the ozone is in the stratosphere, and that's what the satellites are good at. Uh, even profiling satellites uh, like MLS, etc., once you cross into the troposphere, they're really bad. So unfortunately, satellite products for ground level ozone are not usable. So we can't use okay. that. And so that has to be measured in situ at currently, at least. Do we need some uh, technological breakthrough for that? Because I really see this is the future. It's just uh, how to catch up the, the bottom, bottom of measurement. It's never enough, yeah. you know. That's right, would give you, uh, like the carbon actually, carbon flux is now, the carbon satellite is pro progressing very rapidly. And uh, we're moving into the ocean uh, LC CO2 fluxes quite directly using the, the direct measurement by satellite and then the, the model, uh, atmospheric model is a great help. I would encourage students to raise your hand and uh, please, I see Paul has raised his hand, please, Paul. Um, I had some remarks on that. Yeah. yeah, I just had a comment then to kind of join this discussion about the lack of observation. So one thing I was wondering, maybe this is directed more to Anup, is um, how much use has there been made of autonomous uh, vehicles? For example, working in a Southern Ocean project, I see even to get at carbon fluxes, people are trying to in, you know, use things like uh, biogeochemical argo to try and you know, get some nutrient variables here too. Um, how much has that been used in the Indian Ocean? Yeah, so if you think about Argo flux, uh, Argo instruments and all, there's quite a few in the Indian Ocean. Uh, they have been launching them since years. Even now, we have some biogeochemical Argos, etc. Uh, the problem is, of course, they're limited towards certain parameters, uh, it's not, not for everything. So we are getting more information through that, but uh, uh, unfortunately, it's just not enough in terms of the number of parameters they can measure. Uh, the second thing is, in terms of atmospheric, uh, we don't have a similar system uh, for atmospheric observations of ocean observations that's happening. Uh, very recently, the Indian government has bought like a couple of gliders, etc. So the plan is to now start moving more into automated vehicles. Uh, so over the next few years, I think we are going to see a bit of a transformation in terms of how we are making these observations, especially on the ocean side. The atmospheric side, I think we are lagging behind a lot more than the ocean side. Okay, I there is a, 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 a similar question at the chat room to Lisa Roti, Professor uh, Tinos, can someone explain how the deposition velocity is defined and how it differs from the gas exchange velocity? Sorry, it's very noisy here, so I can't ask my question via mic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> can you add yeah. a few more comments on that? Um, yeah, this is, I'm, I'm really sorry. I should have read more about gas exchange velocity, I think, before I came here, um, because I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm trying to read up through uh, through some papers uh, and find what exactly is the difference between the two. Um, but I'm not entirely sure at the moment. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to reply in the chat in a, in a few minutes because at the moment I'm not, I'm not too sure what okay. is exactly the okay. difference. I'm sorry. If somebody else can compliment me, just feel free to. Uh, yeah, Lisa, I think Lisa. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I don't have an answer. I just have a question. I'm I'm wondering if if part of the difference, at least between ozone and and CO two, is ozone being air side controlled instead of water side controlled. And I think, I think that's one main, and another one is the reactivity of ozone when it hits the sea surface. It's super reactive, so it's like an like a sink. The ocean, yeah. the ocean is like an infinite sink. Yeah, ah, like I, ah, okay. yeah, like I said, the, the main the, the main term for ozone velocity and for the determining the ozone flux is really the the part the resistance to the transfer to the to the water and that's where it's reacting very fast. The air side is really very unimportant. It's only playing off of five percent in the flux in the, to, in, in the flux of the ozone. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, uh, what, what exactly do you mean by gas exchange velocity? Uh, 
because as i understand yeah, that's what i it, don't know right? yeah because as i understand deposition velocity and then there's a flux so both of them would match do you mean uh, gas exchange velocity as in uh, the net term of exchange which would include deposition velocity which is downwards and then a flux which is upwards then yes. then the net, net would be a gas exchange i guess uh, yeah, he means the k that's what krista said yeah. in the chat mm -hmm. right yeah. yeah so but i'm not entirely sure how the k compares with the uh, the position velocity we always use in the furrows and so on i think they'd be the same it's just that the deposition velocity truly is only one direction right okay yeah because they they assume there's no there's no uh, other the, the wind speed dependence the wind speed dependence is different right so that's the thing yeah, yeah. but there is a small wind speed dependence for ozone velocity uh, deposition, sorry, rows in deposition, <clears throat> but not in the deposition type term. I'm making this more complex. <laughs> so That's there is a clear to how you, you you calculate just uh just so as the, the the definition of the deposition, the ozone specifically, somebody is confusing. Yeah, it's different from the for that's the deposition, and for example, it's uh. But the CO two gas exchange is quite clear. It's driven by the delta P CO two and the K. It's the uh, uh, gas velocity, solubility, and the CO two uh, partial pressure difference. So that's quite. Mm. Any more question from the students? And uh, really, it's a great opportunity. We have ten minutes uh, to go. If you want to to get more on this, uh, the three talks. Um, Lisa? If, if I may ask a question of, uh, I, th I think perhaps all three of you, but definitely Talib and Lisa Lotta, do you have any feeling for, for what proportion of these natural halogens, um, both biogenic and the inorganic, what proportion of them are able to survive enough to get to the stratosphere and impact stratospheric ozone? I mean, most of what you were talking about was tropospheric ozone, but is there, are they long lived enough to have any impact? Yeah, so um, for a long time, we thought all the iodine compounds were basically reacted away in the lower tro uh, troposphere. But recently, there's been some observations that suggest otherwise. And so they're thinking that the um, heterogeneous um, um, recycling of halogens is probably different than what we assumed so far, and that it can travel more up, uh, higher up in the atmosphere uh, under particulate form. And I think maybe Anup will want to com comment on that. I don't know. <clears throat> yeah, uh, well, a short answer to that, at least for iodine chemistry, is uh, we thought we knew, but now we know we don't know. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> so, so earlier. <laughs> Once again, our assumptions sneak up on us. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is true that, I mean, whatever observations we have so far seems to suggest that most of the organics play a more important role higher up in the stratosphere. Uh, however, there could be uh, instances, for example, uh, during the monsoon period, you have the anticyclone, which takes a lot of particulate matter further up in the UTLS region or a lot of pollutants up in the UTL. So these could be big injection points, even for the species, which uh, usually are important only in the lower troposphere. So that could be one of the main ways through which these shorter lived species through heterogeneous recycling, et cetera, do end up, end up going higher up. So there is a signal of iodine in the stratosphere, uh, but uh, we are not entirely sure whether the tropospheric or the inorganic compounds are really contributing a huge amount to, to that or not. And there are limitations in terms of the science. We are limited by understanding the recycling processes. Uh, there's some experiments going on for that, but for the students, uh, if you are interested in iodine chemistry, which right now is honestly one of the hottest topics in, in terms of atmospheric chemistry. Uh, a good uh, thing to focus on is the recycling of iodine compounds because it has very interesting gas phase chemistry and particulate uh, chemistry, and quite a few of those processes are still not very well known. Thank you. Thank you, Bo.
Do anything in the chat room? No. Yeah, we've okay. posted some papers for uh, yeah, yeah. people who want to understand them. Yeah. Thank you very much, Krista. Sorry, Manu, uh, if, if I can ask a very quick question uh, to Talib, uh, you were showing some very interesting uh, data about uh, halocarbons. Uh, so considering there's a lot of push on kelp farming or uh, growing seaweed as a way to combat climate change, you know, to help with carbon capture, what kind of implications are you looking at in terms of emissions of halocarbons because of this uh, carbon capture technology that people are professing? Oh, thank you. No, the motivation for the study is uh, to look at the impact of this organic carbon <laughs> to the uh, uh, ozone layer or uh, upper part of uh, ozone. Uh, but as you know, that the, this, uh, this is very uh, complicated because we not even know the impact of this organic halocarbon directly to the, to the ozone layer. So I think uh, this is a very new study for, for us in, in Malaysia. We need, we need to know more, uh, even the impact of this halocarbon toward the contraction of surface ozone, for example, or other, other related uh, oxidation based on the, 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 the emission of this halocarbon from seaweed in a tropical region. Because as you know that the photo oxidation in, in our tropical areas is very, very rapid and, and mm -hmm. We have summer all the time, so this actually will contribute the, to the emission of the halocarbon to the atmosphere. So we encourage uh, you, for, especially for the young scientists, to study in our region in tropical areas such as Indonesia and, and Solid Asia. Because it's very interesting. Uh, another example how geoengineering might not exactly work as how we think, right? Because if you grow more kelp to draw down carbon, you end up emitting more halocarbons, which uh, might affect, affect ozone. So yeah. it's, it's, it's a very interesting how these feedbacks always happen in, in the uh, end. It's a, it's a very complicated mm -hmm. feedback system. There's a lot of debates going on in terms of the, the ocean afforestation, the, the macroalgae, how the, the, the negative and the positive impact. Also the the nutrient reallocation, a beetle, whatever. Those are quite a big topic over there. Um, if there is no question, I just want to invite all of us to join me to give the street speaker a big thank. And uh, we'll take a, a break until 9 UTC, okay, in 20 minutes, nine, 19 minutes uh, exactly. Okay, please join us, we come in. Uh, thank you again. In 20 minutes again. Thank you, Minan. Thank you for sharing this. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, you again. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. It's time now, and uh, welcome back. So we're going into a very exciting session, a practical session. For some of you may know that uh, uh, practical is really the, the feature uh, component of the Solar Summer School. Although we were talking about it, it's quite a little bit more difficult than in person, but uh, the organizing committee put the tremendous effort to try to make it as vivid as possible. And uh, so now we have this uh, practical session on modeling and uh, the lead person professor would be Pav and Katie. Uh, Pav is from University of East Angera from the UK and the Katie is from uh, University of Cape Town. Uh, I'm just handing over to them to run this practical session. Pav and Katie is all yours. Okay, thank, thanks, Minhan. Uh, so hello everyone and welcome to this uh, online modeling practical session. Um, I'm just going to share screen because I have a, a short introduction that'll explain what we're going to do in the practical session. So I hope you can all uh, see. Um, I'm sure Paul or Becky will alert me if we have any issues. Now I'm going to try and go into full screen mode and I hope, okay, I hope that's working. Can everyone see the title slide? That's yeah, okay. It's working. 
Okay, great, thanks. All right, so as Minhan said, so I'm Parson Thrillingham and I'll be running this with Katie uh, Cherry from the University of Cape Town. Also Mishka and Sive from the University of Cape Town will be helping us in the breakout sessions. Um, so if you want to reach me, you can contact me at the email um, address listed here. I think we'll upload this presentation as well to the session materials. So it's, uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to try and do this online. Um, and since we have a limited time, we thought, well, how much modeling can we actually do in a, in a two hour slot? So what we've gone for is an online tool called the High Split um, web tool. It's, uh, some of you may have met this already. It looks at um, atmospheric forecasts, atmospheric back trajectories, but the online tool is a very quick way to get you started to look at how air masses move around in the atmosphere. I'll explain the motivation for that in, in a minute. <clears throat> so we're gonna start the session with a very quick introduction. And then what I'm going to do is uh, demonstrate, just give you a very simple example, demonstrating the online tool, um, which you can see at this link. Now, I, I think Paul or Becky are going to put into the chat or maybe have already shared with you a handout, which you will then work on during the breakout sessions. Okay, so the handout runs through an example of how to use the tool to do a simple back trajectory. And then basically at the end, we have some exercises where you're free to do, you know, in your own time during the session, uh, pick some of the exercises. And then if, you, um, if you'd like to, it would be nice if uh, you could maybe put some of the results into a slide or two, and we could uh, share it um, in, the, in the wrap up. So I suggest probably my introduction is gonna take about 10 to 20 minutes. Then we'll go into, um, uh, with, with, with the demonstration, then we'll go into the breakout sessions probably for about an hour and a half, including a break in the middle of it, and then maybe come back together um, at about a quarter to, uh, well, I'm not sure what time zone you're in, but basically about an hour and 45 minutes from now. So about 15 minutes before the end of the session. All right, so, so why do we use back trajectory analysis? So now, you know, you've heard a lot in the previous sessions about the ocean biogeochemistry and the influence on atmospheric chemistry. Um, this practical is gonna focus mostly on the air side, you know, how do the air masses affect observations at a site? So for example, you might have measurements from a SOLAS time series station um, or a coastal station that's part of something like the air gauge network. And you might want to know, well, what do these measurements mean? You know, what are the air masses that are influencing the variations in, this measurement, in these measurements? So what I'm showing here are two recent studies that both have used a high split model analyses to um, estimate, to calculate the influence of air masses on measurements at specific sites. So the one, the, the, um, the study I'm showing on the left <clears throat> is showing you a plot of atmospheric back trajectory. So the different colors represent different levels in the atmosphere. So the red ones are the ones closest to the surface and the blue ones are the ones higher up. And this was actually a study looking at uh, test measurements or the satellite measurements. And there you can see with a satellite column measurement, you'd be very uh, interested to know where in the column the different air masses are impacting your measurements. The, um, the study on the, on the right is actually one uh, looking at um, uh, Cape Point, which is very close to where Katie and the others are based. And this is a study of um, atmospheric mercury uh, measurements at, at Cape Point. So looking at kind of the, the influence, the, the percentage influences of, of source measurements. So the plot here actually, the analysis was done during high split. The plot I think is done uh, using R or some other package. But it gives you an example of the kinds of science you can do with things like back trajectory analyses. Another common use for back trajectory analyses. So this is actually um, an example uh, from a station in China, but it's also used very much for things like coastal stations, like May said, which we'll look at later on, is to separate the influence of what might be the background air, the baseline air. For example, in a coastal station, the background air might be predominantly from the ocean, but at points at sometimes you might see pollution events coming off the land. So you might want to be able to separate what is the influence of the background air 
versus what's the influence of the pollution signal coming off the land. So using back trajectory analyses, looking at where the wind sector is, is a good way of identifying these pollution events. Okay, so the high split model is, um, it's, uh, it's a model that's been developed uh, for over, I think, decades at the NOAA Air Resources Laboratory. Um, it's been used in a wide range of applications. It's both, it can be used both in forecast mode and in back trajectory mode. Um, I, I encourage you to go to the references listed on the website, because then you'll see the whole range of applications. They look at things like influences of wildfires, volcanic ash. They've looked at forecasts of things like radioactive plume dispersion. <coughs> Sorry, I'm losing my voice because I'm also a little bit. <laughs> I hope I'll keep going till the end of the session. Developed, uh, it's it's uh, what's called the combination of a Lagrangian and a, and a Eulerian framework. So what they um, do is they look at uh, combine dispersion models with meteorological fields in a 3D framework. And there's a lot more information about the mechanics of the dispersion system and the examples at these websites. Um, so we're going to be using the online version, which uh, is in a link in your handout. Uh, I should also say that a more commonly used version of it is the downloadable. You can down get a version that you can download for a PC or uh, Macs, or if you're using Linux platforms, and that version is actually much more flexible. The online web version um, is somewhat rigid in the kinds of uh, parameters, timeframes you can look at. So if you want to do any more detailed analysis of your science, um, I encourage you to look into the, the downloadable version. Uh, but uh, one of the you know great advantages is it's publicly available. You can calculate forward and backward trajectories, and you can also pick different types of meteorological driver data, different resolutions, different regions, and so forth. And um, with the online tool, you can you have all this flexibility, and you can also do things like specify uh, trajectory durations. And I'll show you a few examples of this type of thing. And you can also produce plots, which you could embed in your in your publications. Okay. And again, you know, the lots more detail on the website. The website really, including actually online tutorials. So it's a very useful. So this is really uh, to serve as an introduction to this tool. If you haven't met it before, there's a lot more detail on the website. All right, I'm going to be using um, in this practical, one of the stations I'll use is the Mace Head Station here. It's part of the A gauge network. It also makes measurements in the NOAA network. It's a coastal site and it's a very interesting site because it samples air both coming off the Atlantic and then also sees signals from continental Europe. Okay, and I think it's the example that we use in the handout. So here, for example, I'm showing a typical uh, plot from the high split web tool uh, for two back trajectories at this at this site at Mace Head uh, at two different levels. So you can this is the kind of plot you'd get, you know, if you run a very simple analysis. Uh, the red trajectory is um, the one closer to the surface, starting at five meters height, and the blue trajectory is is higher up. And you can see the Prevailing wind direction is mostly easterly, but there is some different. There are some differences in the directions at altitude. Okay, so just a quick and um, summary on what what is back trajectory analysis. So it basically identifies the path for. Okay, and the way they do it is it's a combination of using uh, meteorological data and numerical modeling to identify the most likely sources of influence. And there I stress most likely because there's going to be uncertainty, just like in a weather forecast, there's going to be uncertainty in any kind of back trajectory estimate. It's a similar methodology. Okay, and in terms of back trajectories, you know, if you, you know about weather forecasts, it's very similar. The, me the methodology tracks the air parcel backwards in time because we know the meteorological fields, um, that we have the history of the meteorological fields. Uh, if you want to know more about the equations and the nuts and bolts, this reference I've listed here, the, one of the original papers, Draxler and Hess, um, lays out the original methodology. It's since been updated by some of the other papers in the handout, including the Stein 2015 paper. 
but basically, you know, you're integrating the rate of change of position with time, which is your velocity vector. You numerically solve this. So you, at any given point in time, your new uh, position is based on your initial condition plus the integration of the velocity field, plus things like, which I've kind of not included here, things like atmospheric turbulence dispersion and so forth. And that's one of the things that introduces the uncertainty into your estimate. Um, this is just a quick schematic to show. So you can think about this either as a forward forecast or a backward forecast. So say we start, let's, let's think about it as a forward forecast because it's simpler, but you can just reverse it in time to think about back trajectories. But say we start at time t equals zero at some initial position x of, of that time. Then you, you step through the numerical integration process, t1, t2, and so forth. And what I'll try to do with the of these arrows here is give you an idea of the certainty of that, of that forecast. So your first few steps are going to be much more certain because there's less uncertainty in your forecast or equal, you know, equivalent in your back trajectory than if you go further forward into time or further backward into time. So that's something to be aware of when you're running back trajectories. Um, your back trajectory estimate for the first day or two uh, is likely to be much more certain than your back trajectory estimate, you know, for five days ago or something. Okay, just some examples of data sets um, available for the high split tool. Uh, this global reanalysis is from the NCAR NCEP project. And it's the one that I tend to use a lot, partly because it's global. And so you can use um, any given location on the globe. It's also the one with the longest time history. So it starts from 1948 to the present. And I'll show you in a minute how, how we get to these. But, but it's, I think it's available at one degree resolution. You can also get much higher time, uh, higher spatial resolution meteorological data sets. For example, this, this ETA data simulation set over North America. But then some of the disadvantages there, you're constrained to certain regions. But if you're interested, for example, in high resolution meteorology over a region, you can look through the high split web options and you know pick a meteorological data set of your choice. Um, I'm just going to finish with a few examples uh, showing examples of back trajectories. Here I'm going to use actually our local uh, atmospheric measurement station at the University of East Anglia where I work. It's at the, it's called the Weybourne Atmospheric Observatory and it's on the North Norfolk coast. If people know what uh, the UK looks like, uh, the North Norfolk coast is part of that sort of bump that sticks out on the Eastern side of England. So we make a lot of atmospheric measurements there. And I think one of the exercises actually we're using some carbon monoxide measurements from this observatory. So this is, you know, a very basic back trajectory calculation, a 24 hour back trajectory calculation. So here's Weybourne, that's the site on the North Norfolk coast. It's just a 24 hour back trajectory calculation at, a, at the start time of October 10th um, at this longitude and latitude. And then I'm just showing you some examples of different back trajectories. You can run this in the high split web where I've just given different starting heights. So you can see that, for example, the wind direction changes slightly as you go from the surface, which is the red one, to altitude, to higher altitudes, uh, two kilometers, which is the pale green one. Um, another feature, um, which you can you can use on the on the high split web tool is actually you can specify uh, as, uh, an observ an observation point, but then you can start the back trajectories at different points. So you might want to say, well, um, not only am I interested in the source of the air mass at this particular time, but I want to know a little bit about the history over the past twenty four hours. So you can choose to start it at intervals from a given point. And when we when I run through the demo, I'll, I'll show you how to do that. So this one, for example, you can see that over the, this one I think uh, runs uh, for about, uh, I think I've started it at uh, about in the past 24 hours from the original time. And you can see the prevailing wind direction didn't change too much. So the, the lower plot on the left-hand side shows you where each trajectory was started in time going backwards. 
And then this final one is actually a much longer back trajectory calculation, so a five-day back trajectory calculation, again, starting at the same time. So you get a sense of where this air mass has originated from. Um, again, with the sort of caveat that the further back in time you go, the less certain your, your uh, back trajectory estimate becomes. So this, in this case, the air mass is estimated to have originated somewhere over Russia. Okay. Um, there are other features you can use in the, in the high split web, and we'll uh, I'll, I'll point them out to you as we run through the online demo. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to um, go into the online demo just to give you an illustration of of the tool, and then we'll go into the breakout groups. So I hope you can still see my screen. Now, if you um, what I'm going to try and see, okay. Okay. Can you see that? Okay. So, if you um, launch the high split tool, which you'll find the link in your handout, you should go to this initial screen. Okay. So, if you want to run back trajectories, so as I said, there's a whole host of different options. There's a dispersion model. There's different types of chemical forecasts you can run. In this session, we're going to focus on the back trajectory analysis. If you actually scroll down, you can see a lot of the different features. You can also see, for example, how to get the downloadable versions of HighSplit. And there really is a lot of information on the website and, and you, as you'll see in, in the web tools. We're going to run the trajectory model for back trajectory. So we'll click on that. So I hope people can see that. Um, now you'll see a few And you'll come to a screen like this, which allows you to specify the type of trajectory that you want to run. Now, for now, I'm going to just okay, there are other options that you want to assemble one allows you to start, you know, a few different, it gives you a measure of the uncertainty. Okay, so it'll it'll start a little ensemble forecast or ensemble hindcast. Okay. with that option during the um, uh, during the practical session. The matrix one is also matrix one allows you to put a spatial little grid around your around your observation point to sort of see you know not just that particular site but some site within a few degrees you know so sites within a few degrees of your observation. The frequency one um, uh, allows you to uh, start different trajectory frequencies so you can. Uh, it's a bit like the, the one where you lag like it in time, so you, you can see information about that below. But let's just stick with the normal one for now, so you just click next. Okay, so this is the this is an important screen. This is the one where we specify what type of meteorological field we want to use. And as I said, in my case, I usually go with this reanalysis field, reanalysis. So you'll have to scroll down to select it. Um, as I said, there are many other ones with higher time resolution, but also they can be US uh, focused regionally. Um, so this one is a little bit more uh, flexible in that if, I, if you use this, you can specify sites all over the globe. So we're going to go with that for the, for the demo. Um, what I've entered in here, so I've already preempted this. These are the uh, you, there are different ways of specifying how you want to uh, what, what your what your point your observation point is going to be. You can specify it in terms of lat long, or you can even actually choose to specify cities and airports. Um, there are different ways you can do it. Uh, you can play with this during the session. But what I've entered here are the coordinates actually for May's head. And now uh, another slightly more complex um, screen. Here is where we specify uh, what time period we want to analyze. So this screen, so this is for the reanalysis meteorological product. This screen gives you time history of the meteorological data files they have archived. So it's basically going by date. I'm going to scroll down. How, excuse yeah. me, Pa. Yes. 
Uh, your voice is up and down. I'm not sure you're using headset or. Oh, no, I think it's because, the, yeah, sorry, yeah, I'm can using you my mic. The, approach the, 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 the mic anyway, please. Okay, Thank you. I'll, I'll, um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, so I'm, I'm, can you hear me now? Um, I'm yeah, going to yeah, scroll perfect. down to, I'm going to scroll down to 2007 October, select that one. Okay. Uh, so one thing I should say, the slight inflexibility of the web-based tool is you're forced to choose monthly meteorological data sets. So if you choose to analyze a back trajectory for say five days, make sure that your initial start time is well within that monthly period. Okay, it's, else you might end up with um, an error message when you're generating uh, your plots, which says we've hit the end of the meteorological time boundary. So that's one of the inflexibilities about the web-based tool as opposed to the um, downloadable version. All right, so another slightly more complicated screen. Again, you know, we'll be around in the breakout sessions to help you through this, but this one gives you a lot of choices. And very helpfully, on the right hand side of the screen are a whole range of buttons giving you more information about each of the options. Now, I think in the handout, I've actually gone, walked through uh, some of these options. What we're going to do is select for back trajectories the backward. It's already clicked here, the backward option here. Uh, model vertical velocity, we're going to stick with that one. So there are some default options set up. You'll see that when you, when you go into the screen. This is my start latitude and longitude already entered. These options here are if you pick some of the other options, things like ensemble forecast, grid forecast. And uh, this one, this set here is if you pick different level heights. So I'm going to leave it at 50 meters for now, 50 meters above mean sea level. So those are the specifications of the type of trajectory plot you want to run. Um, again, I'm going to, the, the second panel here is about what type of plot you want to get or how you want to download your data. Uh, I'm going to leave it as uh, with, mo all these are default settings. I'm going to leave it with the default settings. You can play with these uh, during the um, breakout sessions. So I'm going to request a, a PDF file. Uh, it comes automatically with a GIF file. And if you want, you can also dump the meteorological data if you want to click some of those. Okay, and then that's it, that's it. And then we just request the trajectory. And then it should go to a screen where you see it, see it work calculating. And hopefully in a few seconds, we'll get um, a PDF and a GIF that uh, gives us the back trajectory plot. So then you should end up with something like this. Now you might run, uh, just to warn you, sometimes the web tool will sometimes crash if you give it, for example, um, uh, a time, time limit, you know, a duration that's outside its uh, meteorological data set or latitude. For example, if you're using a regional meteorological set, data set, if you give it a lap long, that's outside, but it'll then crash and tell you in this window uh, that it's gone wrong. So let's click on the GIF. And then there you'll see that's the back trajectory coming from you know the northwesterly direction to Mayshead for that day. Okay, and then you have the option of returning to the main menu with your pre-selected data, and then you can modify them as you wish, or you can clear it and go back and, and start and do new sets of data. Okay, so I think. I think that's all I'm going to say for now. Okay. Um, are there any questions right now? I think otherwise we'll probably go into the breakout groups. I think there are four of us and we'll be uh, moving among the breakout groups. If you, I hope you can all access the, um, handout sheet. So you can just work through the basic example and then try some of the exercises. And then, as I said, it would be nice if, you know, you want to put some of the, the, the exercises. Um, I think the first set just allow you to explore the parameters of the high split web tool. And then there are a couple at the end that allow you to analyze uh, chemical signatures. So uh, the first, I think exercise number three looks at 
CFC uh, type concentrations, variations at the A gauge site, A gauge sites, and asks you to see if you can see anomalies and pollution events and um, look into the air mass influence. And then I think the last exercise is looking at carbon monoxide at Weybourne, and again, asks you to analyze pollution events and sources of influence. So it'd be nice if you want to put something together, we can, we can share at the end. But I think uh, that's it for now. Katie, did you want to um, add anything? That was great, Parv. I guess the only thing I'll add is, in addition to the online high split resources, um, you also can run high split from within Python. Um, there's a pi split package, which is really efficient for those who have lots of batch trajectories to run for their research. And I believe you can also run it from within R's open air package. So just to add those two resources, and, and Paul will make sure we add those online for the students. Hi, everyone. I hope you all enjoyed playing with high split. Um, do, we have, um, do we have everyone? Back? Are you there, Parv? Yeah, I think I'm, we have I'm back. back. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have all the breakout rooms back? Mm -hmm. I think so. Okay. Um, do you wanna do you wanna go, Katie, or shall I sum up? Or... Oh, uh, up to you. Um, so, but why don't we? Um, I, th I thought why don't we? Um, have a quick go around of the room. So I hope you know this was a good introduction. And you know, you probably just scratched the surface of the capability. It was mostly to give you an idea of what uh, this this tool offers, both the online version and I said the as I said the downloadable version is much more flexible. And I think Katie is going to have a few words to say about the additional capabilities of that. Um, maybe maybe it, what I'd suggest is maybe we just go around the groups. I was pleased to see that the groups. Uh, sort of you know working together sharing screen and and so forth so i think each of the groups maybe could come on and and um you know say a few things either show some slides or uh, give some reaction to you know their analyses using the tool i realized that the exercises i put on the handout might have been too ambitious for this very short uh, practical but you know if you're interested you know maybe you can go away and look at especially some of the chemical signatures and look at how you can use the tool to analyze them um, so let me uh, then move on to the groups and then maybe Katie, you can say something about the online version and, and wrap up. Okay, so should we start? Um, should we start with uh, room one? So I know that um, you guys, so that's the group I was in with the, the most time. I know you guys were looking at different types of trajectory analyses. So does one of you or all of you want to come on and uh, share your share your reactions? Yeah, um, is it all good if I share my screen? Okay. Um, so we just have four plots here. Um, we started looking at, this is the Ross ice shelf or like the, the tip of the Ross ice shelf in um, Antarctica, um, which is, it's not very clear, but I guess, yeah, just to situate you, that's where we are. Um, and this is the ocean, not land. Um, so I guess we just did um, 17th of May, 2022. So very recently, um, and it looked like um, the wind traveled from, you know, sort of higher elevation to a lower elevation once it reached the, the ice shelf. Um, yeah, and then we did the same day, but for different elevations. Um, and we sort of concluded that they all look like they're descending um, as they sort of meet the, the ice shelf. Um, and then we compared sort of summer, which is um, January um, in the Southern Ocean and sort of June, July is winter in the Southern Ocean. Um, and so we compared, um, I guess, where the air masses were coming from. And I mean, the general direction looks like it could be similar, but there's, I think, a bit more uncertainty in, in the summer months. And um, sort of like looking at this, this bit looks like it's sort of noise whereas this could be a an actual pathway and um we also 
saw that the elevation is much higher in winter. The winds are coming from a potentially much higher elevation, which we thought could be um, because the air mass might be lighter due to there being less water vapor um, in the air mass, whereas the water vapor in, in summer might be higher, which would make it heavier and, and be lower. Uh, would anyone else in my group like to add anything? <laughs> Sorry, that was quite long. Thanks, Emma. I thought that was I thought it was really interesting, and I think um, especially I was really pleased to hear the discussion about uh, the other atmospheric variables. Um, one thing Katie mentioned uh, to me earlier, and I think she'll talk about it later, is there is a chance to use or download other types of meteorological data onto your plot. I think Katie will talk about that later. Um, and another thing that actually came up, I think, in our discussions in that in in uh, in group one, is that um, we need to think about the resolution of the met data that we're using. So, for example, I know that um, you were initially looking at different types of heights, but they weren't very vertically separated. So you need to think about whether the meteorological data can actually support those kinds of fine scale that the data set that you're using. So you, if you're doing a regional analysis of the Ross Sea, if there is a high resolution MET data set available, that might be more suitable to then look at a fine scale atmospheric transport analysis. Okay, so if anyone else from Thank group you. one wants to comment, otherwise maybe we'll move on to group two. Yeah, that's a great segue to group two because Raisa actually was the one who uh, investigated the addition of rainfall data. So maybe she can start us off. Yeah, hello everyone, I'm Haisa. So uh, I'll share my screen here with the plot that I made. I was actually trying to find signals of the intertropical convergence zone. So this is a basically plot explaining the migration of the intertropical convergence zone in Brazil. And I was trying to find the signals in the data going backwards and trying to relate that with the rainfall. So that's what I was asking Katie, if we could plot on the same uh, plot the rainfall. And we found that you could have an option in the website to put the, the meteorological data with your plot. So here you have the rainfall uh, just below the map. And uh, I found like a slight signal with of the water mass migration uh, from April to July, the, the shift in the directions of the air masses probably related to the migration of the intertropical convergence zone. So that was basically what I did. <laughs> No, oh, that, that's really excellent. I'm actually, I'm really glad that you're able to use the tool to actually inform some things you're currently working on. So did you, um, did you generate any plots with the, um, the rainfall data? You... No, I just plotted them just below here. And oh yeah, can... okay, I see that. Oh, I, I, uh, I thought... Unfortunately, with then we can't actually see like the seasonal variability because the rainfall for this day that I chose was not very high. So it was not that big but it is like usually January to April you have much uh, a lot of rainfall and from July to the end of the year you have like the dry season and it's related to the migration of the convergence zone. So Katie I think with the um, downloadable version you can actually get spatial plots of the met variables as well can't you? You can actually, I was telling the students, so on the, that screen where you end up where it says where you can choose the GIF or the PDF, underneath is a line called trajectory endpoints file. You can actually download that and it has everything you need to plot the whatever meteorological variables um, you're interested in. It's actually right here, the data. Oh, right. Yeah, yes. you went ahead and downloaded it. Yeah, so yeah. It's even good. in the online version, it's very easy to extract that. You can see there, right, it says lat long data yeah. Um, and then there's pressure and rainfall. Rainfall is the very last column. The last column here. Exactly. Yeah. 
great, great. So I think uh, in our group, uh, Anna also did some interesting plots, so she can show what she wants. <laughs> Yeah, a more confused plot, maybe. <laughs> uh, um, no, but it, this tool was very helpful. It's very user friendly and uh, for someone who doesn't work with uh, atmosphere science that much, it's uh, really nice. <clears throat> so that was very helpful. But I actually, uh, we had this uh, sand storm event in Gothenburg earlier this spring, and I was thinking maybe I could track that air mass basically um so i try i can see if we can share so first i just uh, did this with the normal traject back trajectory and then we ended up somewhere in poland so this is five years the five days back but then when i did the ensemble i actually get one like air mass coming from uh, this area here and going over Spain, which was like the most affected uh, apparently by this uh, sandstorm. Um, so then it got me like curious on uh, how to use ensemble, but I didn't get uh, that much further in this thought. Katie told me that it depends on how you, uh, like how you uh, define your variables within uh, ensemble as well. But I thought it was interesting that you can actually find uh, if you know what you're looking for, you can find things with the ensemble that you wouldn't if you only did one uh, back trajectory. So yeah, that was my, <laughs> a little bit confused. <laughs> no, thanks. And I think it is useful to explore the capabilities of the ensemble. And I didn't go into too much detail, but um, the ensemble, I think I explained it to one of the groups, the ensemble forecast depends a little bit on um, different realizations. So this high split model is a combination both of a kind of Lagrangian model where you have releases of multiple particles or multiple air masses. And then it uses the, the Eulerian framework of the fixed, um, of the advective fields. And so the ensemble forecast comes from sort of using the statistics, varying the statistics in the Lagrangian one. So it's, as, as, as you said, setting different parameters up to get different realizations of that air mass transport. So um, uh, yeah, it, it gives you an idea of the uncertainty. So you might get, you know, some trajectories that, uh, as, you, as you showed, you know, are quite different from the, from the majority but it kind of comes from the statistics of the meteorology that they use when they specify those different particles, those different air mass uh, trajectories in the, in the Lagrangian framework. So I think there's more, especially in, the, um, in some of those references lifted at the handout, if you want to get more detail about the ensemble forecasting method, there's more detail in that. But yes, I think, and also I think with the ensemble forecast, you have more flexibility in defining how your ensemble is set up when you use the downloadable tool than when you use the online online version, where I think you get a fixed set of parameters specifying um, the uncertainties. Um, but yeah, thanks. Uh, so I think we're getting close to the end of the hour. So maybe we better move on to groups three and four. Yeah, I can get us started with uh, group three and maybe um, Jim can say something about our results. So um, I think our results aren't as interesting as the ones from the other groups because we um, mainly stick to what the tasks were. Um, but oh, I haven't shared my screen yet. So um, we first looked into um, that single trajectory thing um, with the station in the UK. Um, and we looked into like where the, where the question was, um, if you look at different times, if we see a change and where the MS come from. Um, and we could see a change indeed. Um, so we looked at December and June of the same year. And this very last plot is on the same day as the plot in the middle, but for another, um, so this is day and this is night. 
And uh, the only thing that we were, we found confusing was that um, the map is different for even though we didn't we didn't select another um, zoom factor, but we're showing a different um, part of the map, which is probably a little bit confusing if you want to compare those. And after that, we looked into um, or we did an analysis with ensemble averages. But there's not much to say about this. It's just um, that we could get an impression of how that works. And um, yeah, Chem, do you want to go on with um, those two plots? Okay, sure. So this was uh, the test number three, where we look at the data available to identify days with. Uh, pollution of different species. And uh, so in the end, we decided to use the one where multiple species showed a P in the data set, which was, uh, let me check really quick, uh, on the 9th of October, 2010. So we did, uh, well, we did a backward trajectory analysis for that specific area. And what we, have seen is that uh, actually so on the left is a 24 hours uh, backtrack analysis on the right is a 48 hours a two day one uh, they show more or less the same thing uh, except that the 48 hours one shows a bit more detail of course and uh, the general consensus was that uh, that pollution was coming from the continent uh, directly all the way up to Ireland so this was it uh, Lucas can you go to the next one so for the fourth one, uh, again, we looked at the data and we tried to identify peak points uh, that we could take a look at. And in the end, uh, the highest point we could find in the data set was on the 4th of March, 2018. We had a peak at five o'clock in the morning. Uh, you can see that peak that goes all the way to 450 uh, is where we're looking at. So by selecting the exact time and uh, trying to do, uh, again, a backward trajectory, uh, once again, we have this uh, continental pollution that is reaching the UK, basically, with the uh, wind patterns. So as uh, Lucas said, we just stuck with uh, the task that we had. So nothing very groundbreaking or interesting, but so, uh, well, it was, fun to learn. Well, thanks. I thought I thought that was pretty interesting. I think you made a lot of headway, um, you know, getting the data downloaded and, and identifying the pollution peaks. It was sort of what I was hoping, um, you know, you would have some time to do. So yes, and I think identifying the continental source. I mean, Mace Head is notably subject to both these ocean versus continental influences. So to be able to pick up that continental influence in the MS trajectories, I think is is really good. So thanks, thanks for that. That, that was very, very nicely done. Um, should we move on to group four? Is that me? Yeah, that's me. Okay. <laughs> um, so if I can figure out how to share the screen, I will do that. Yeah, this is just, uh, I was also not doing as interesting studies. I was just going through the tasks. Um, and so this is kind of from task three where I uh, found some days in the pollution data where we're showing pollution. And in the top left is kind of where I started out, where I just had the normal one at um, three different heights. And I was really curious because it kept showing it coming from the ocean. And I picked another day where the data was flagged and it was also coming from the ocean. So that's when I decided to just turn it into the um, other form here where it has, it kind of, like you said, it shows more of the true movements that are happening. And that was kind of the first hint I got that maybe there is additional input. So then I basically, instead of just doing a 24, 48 hour timeline over here, um, I switched to doing a longer range, basically a five day backscatter. And that's when I actually, this really interesting thing occurred where it came across the land, shot down in off the coast here, and then went up north towards the actual measuring site which then I put back down into the normal one. So that's the last graph you can see on the right here, which just, you can actually see this difference based on 
how many days you look back from. But that was my lesson learned from that one. And yeah, I think that's all I'm gonna show. I have a million different images popped up. So this is the only one I could kind of grab to show you guys in a coherent way. Thanks very much, Brandy. Uh, is there anyone else from your group who wants to, to jump in? Um, so I think another thing I wanted to add, I think it's it's really useful the way you explored, you know, different length trajectories. If you were going to use this in a in a paper, one thing you will probably want to do is sort of quantify some of the uncertainty. And that's something you can do a little bit more easily with the downloadable version, because I think you can also get statistics of the uncertainties of these trajectories. So here you've highlighted one or two that potentially came from over land. But I think as I showed in, say, one of the early slides in the presentation, there are ways to actually quantify the, the percentage likelihood of coming from a region using you know, some of the more complex capabilities of high split. Um, so I think we better wrap up because we're way past our time. But Katie, do you want to come in? And, and uh, yeah, we also have a question, Raisa. Hi, I just have a question. Uh, uh, with the downloadable one that you can run in your PC, is it possible to make like a monthly average of the backwards directions and everything, the trajectory? Because we um, only I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna hand over to Katie because I think she knows a lot more about the download. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So high split for the downloadable version has a really cool feature called clustering. So you could okay. run trajectories for a whole month um, in whatever <laughs> iteration you wanted to for the same place, and then it will do some statistical clustering for you to essentially pull out the averages. Okay. Um, yeah. Nice, thanks. Um, Katie, do you want to say a few more uh, words about the downloadable version or uh, your experience with high split before we wrap up? Uh, there's and just one more question. More so questions. I'd rather let, let students ask questions than me wax on lyrically. So, Emmanuel? Um, yeah, hi, I had a really quick question. Um, are there any equivalent Lagrangian models for oceanic current analysis, which maybe could be combined with high splits? I don't know if this is some kind of thing which can be done or if it, if it would make sense, maybe. You know, that's a really good um, question. I was actually thinking about it when I was preparing this tutorial. Um, I haven't encountered in my teaching an online version that's easy to use. I don't know if anyone else, any of the other lecturers have experience with this because I thought, you know, high split, we use a lot. Um, for quick analyses, I haven't met a similar ocean tool. There are things like, you know, ocean data view that will have some data accessible, but I've not found one yet that's as easy to use as high split. But maybe some of the other lecturers have experience. I guess that's a no for now. But if we find out, if I find out more information, I'll pass it on. Um, to the group, um, maybe through the organizers. Okay, thanks. Okay, Katie, did you want to add anything before we wrap up? No, I think let's leave it there. We can always add more information during the um, on the Hoover Q and A. So I think we're running a bit of time. Let's pass it off to Minhan. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Okay. Thank you. I think that uh, was an awesome uh, uh, section. And uh, thank you very much for Av and Katie and uh, the two tutors. Um, so um, thank you all very much again on everyone for your engagement so far. We are now moved to the final installment in a series of fresh uh, repre uh, presentation. I think this is the final group of the students. Um, Let's get it started. And uh, if you want to see the po four posts, I think the you can uh, look at event hub. Uh, I'm sure. I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. So we have the uh, the the sequence of the presentation here. Get. Let's get started. Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. 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 So I'll be giving a short uh, presentation on a, on a project I worked on in Xiamen University, and it's tied to the regional wind speed variability modulates carbon sink in the Northwest Pacific. So I'm um, grateful for like the collaborators on this project, whom some of them are here today, and uh, specifically my my advisor when I was in Xiamen University, Minhan, 
and uh, other collaborators. So he remains my advisor and mentor. So uh, onto the, the, the topic, uh, the study area is of great uh, regional and global significance as it's home to the Croatia Extension Region, which is a major hotspot of ocean carbon uptake. So our study area was divided into the subtropical, subarctic, and the transition zone, which is like a mixing zone between the both regions. So to understand PCO2 and SE flood variability, we investigated SST, salinity, chlorophyll, mixed layer depth, and wind speed. And from our studies, we found out that sea surface temperature had an heterogeneous relationship with PCO2. This means that in the subarctic, the PCO2 find the subtropic it increases with temperature, which is the normal thermodynamic behavior of CO2 and sea surface temperature. So overall, the entire region acted as a strong sink. And from our studies, we found out that wind variability modulation in the subtropical region was responsible for this. And we can see that in a strong correlation from my cover photo and figure four and figure five B. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Uh, 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 good, good evening, everyone. My name is Fang a PhD student from China. I'm talking about the characteristics and the MSPD processes of VOC over the South China Sea. Marine atmosphere is usually considered to be a clean environment. But this study indicates that the lower atmosphere of South China Sea suffers from even worse air quality than coastal cities. To analyze, were based on meteorological parameters, trace gases, and high tide resolution VOC measured by PTR, Gulf MS, and island side in the downwind area of Pierre Liwa Delta from November to December 2021. The observations show that the cities of Pierre Liwa Delta, based on the concentration of ocean and the wind direction, be case were analyzed in this study. Ocean also occurred, occurred at island consistent with the mission ratio of ocean backshore increase significantly compared to those non episode days. OVOC were the abundant chemicals during the ocean polluted days. Diurnal of the VOC were consistent with the fresh air mass from the Pierre Delta. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. So, all right. So I am Malia Khan from Shaman University, and I'll speak fast because that's one minute. So I'm working on the um, spatial temporal distribution of biogenic silica through the lens of mesoscale eddy systems, and why they're important, because they are the um, weather of the oceans, and they can provide a spatial heterogeneity and temporal variability in, associ in association with upwelling and downwelling. They can also have a huge impact on tragic ecosystems, biogeochemical cycles, and phytoplankton community structures. So these edges can go through an evolution during their life cycles and subsequently can have a very dynamic particle flux rate. So the objective of our study is to investigate a cyclonic eddy in Northwestern Pacific subtropical gyre for four consecutive weeks to better understand the dynamics of biogenic silica in association with large phytoplankton blooms such as diatoms in oligotrophic regime. For this reason, we have studied several parameters like temperature, salinity, density uh, with the cyclonic eddy systems and picosanthine and total chlorophyll as a pigment for productivity indicator. Along with that, we have used 234 thorium radionuclide for biogenic silica flux rate um, in this area. So if you have any questions, you can contact me on the email provided on the bottom of the poster. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Next, please. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm gonna talk about the emission pathway and secondary formation of atmospheric amines over ocean. It has been demonstrated to be an important stabilizer in the new particle formation, which may significantly affect the global radiation balance and climate change. Ocean is an important contributor to amines. Uh, however, how are amines emitted from the seawater and how are they transferred into the aeros aerosol phase is still unclear. Based on a uh, measurement during a cruise in Chinese marginal sea, we found that amines are emitted from the seawater through different pathways, uh, i.e. Uh, sea spray and air-sea exchange. The gaseous amines are transferred into aerosol phase through acid-based neutralization. 
uh, and this concentration correlated well with the ratio of SO2 to sulfate. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Next, please. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Yao Hua from Xiamen University. Uh, global oceans are important in absorbing anthropogenic CO2 emitted into the atmosphere through air exchange. And understanding the processes which control PCO2 variations can improve the polarizations of biogeochemical processes and in turn modeling and prediction. Here we examine the seasonal variations of the sea of PCO2 in a subtropical coastal system based on time series observations. Now we find that unlike the subtropical open ocean, the seasonal cycle of the sea of PCO2 was not dominated by temperature in our sites. Instead, biological PCO2 drawdown frequently exceeded the connective effect of the seasonal warming from late spring to early autumn. And horizontal and vertical mixing nearly counterbalanced the decrease in PCO2 expected from cooling from late autumn to early spring. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Okay. Hello, everyone. I am Shen Xianzhou from Fudan University. Today, I will briefly introduce my PhD research. We know marine biogenic activities will produce and emit a lot of react reactive gases into the atmosphere and make great contributions to atmospheric aerosols. Amines and dimethyl sulfate, DMS, are two important reactive gases. Uh, and by conducting extensive aerosol observations, the distributions, sources, and the formation pathways of aerosol aminiums and the methane sulfonic acid over coastal seas were investigated. And we revisited the robustness of using MSA as an indicator for marine biogenic sources. In addition, I have constructed a prediction model for sea surface DMS concentration based on artificial neural network. Then the current distributions, controlling factors, and the future changes of global DMS concentration and emission flux were adjusted. Uh, and for more, more detailed information, if you are interested in, you can refer to this poster and or contact me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, please. Hi everyone, I'm Manami Tozawa and a PhD student at Hokkaido University in Japan. My research is about the partial pressure of CO2 in the polar ocean. In my master's, I researched the variability of PCO2 from winter to summer in the Southern Ocean and assessed the factors of that variability quantitatively. As you can see from the color scale of figure two, biological activity decreased the PCO2 and temperature variability increased the PCO2 significantly. In addition, we found the temporal and spatial differences between these effects. Now I research the PCO2 in the Arctic Ocean. Unlike the Southern Ocean, river water is input into the Arctic Ocean, so I try to divide the effect of river water from the effects of sea ice and glacier ice melt water. If you have some comments or ideas, please contact me. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Hi, everyone. My name is Emma de Jong. I'm a master's student at Victoria University in Wellington um, in New Zealand. My project is about using biomarkers in multiple archives to recreate primary production in the Ross Sea of Antarctica. As I'm sure most of us know, phytoplankton play an essential role in marine ecosystems and the global carbon cycle, and we need information about past primary production rates to understand how they might change in a warmer world. Currently, we are limited by short satellite records, which is where the biomarkers come in. They are chemical traces of previously living organisms with the potential to reconstruct past abundance and community composition of phytoplankton, as they can be preserved in ice cores and in sediment cores. So my project analyzes the biomarkers present in sediment core tops, snow and ice samples, and filtered ocean water from the Ross Sea. So our preliminary results show that biomarkers are present in an ice core from Roosevelt Island, which is very exciting. Um, if you've got any questions or want any more information, um, my information is on Hoover. 
Hello. Um, I am Alexa Samakari from NIWA and the University of Otago in New Zealand. So in this poster, I'm presenting in the first part a method that we developed to sample a DMS in the Cisophas microlayer. So this method is using a gas permeable tube and uh, is working on, um, on the principle of gas uh, diffusion due to the concentration gradient. Um, and uh, it showed to be uh, more uh, accurate than the plate and the screen that are the most used method for now to sample the Cisophas microlayer. And in the second part of this poster, I'm presenting the results from a study that we conducted in the open ocean. So we sampled the Cisophas microlayer to um, establish what is uh, driving uh, DMS enrichment in the Cisophas microlayer. And also we carried out deck incubation to try to understand to study the DMS processes in it and relate them to the enrichment of DMS in the Cisophas microlayer. So if you want more information, you can ask me. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Next, please. Uh, so hi, everyone. My name is Andrea Milinkovic, and I'm from Zagreb, Croatia. I'm working at the Roger Bosch Croatia Institute, and currently I'm a PhD student on the Ready project. The aim of this project is to assess the impact of atmospheric uh, deposition on complex biochemical responses of oligotropic systems, considering the importance of uh, promotion and inhibition effects on phytoplankton and the consequent altering of the surface water chemistry, including the sea surface microlayer. Uh, my work on this project includes uh, laboratory and modeling studies, as well as comprehensive field work, which uh, includes the mesocosm uh, experiment at the central Adriatic which is an oligotropic water zone and the hotspot area to study the biochemical effects of atmospheric deposition on the Adriatic Sea. If you're interested in my work and uh, this topic in general, please feel free to come to my poster or contact me. And thank you for your uh, attention. Wonderful, thank you. Next, please. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Hao from Texas A&M University, Corpus Christi. This poster shows my study about methane emissions from subtropical microgrades in northwest of Gulf Mexico. I measured methane fluxes at both sediment water and water air interfaces to discover the methane transport from sediment to water and to the atmosphere. I found tidal processes and magnitudes were important factors influencing methane emissions in these creeks. Moreover, methane emissions increased dramatically after the, after the extreme cold events, probably due to large deposition of organic carbon caused by the death of mangrove forests. It further indicated the impact of the extreme weather on methane emissions from mangroves. For more details, please see my poster. If you have any question, please contact me. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Next, please. Okay, that's all done. Awesome. Um, I think it's extremely challenging to give this lightning talk. You did very, very well. I think the, the only suggestion would be for one slide, the whole poster or just the ones uh, reform the slide would be uh, your choice, okay, for the future. We have a couple minutes for open for question if you have, um, just please raise your hand. Any question among yourself or from the tutors? No? Okay, Lisa, please. I just have a quick question for uh, Manami. Um, your uh, work in uh, Mosaic, you saw a very clear change that, um, in the eastern and western transects, the PCO2 were very, very different. Do you think that's spatial or seasonal? Yes. Hi. Did. Go ahead, Manavi. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> I think it's very interesting point. 
and uh, actually I don't know why uh, why there is that different, but and uh, I think it is uh, si um, temporal reliability. I think. That seems that seems likely to me also, but they are very different water masses. Those two, mm, you know, yeah. those two areas also. So that should that could be something interesting to look at as you dig deeper into the data. Yeah. But yes, my first instinct also is is seasonal that it's temporal, but mm. it'll be interesting to see. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I think it is very difficult to divide temp and, and temporal and the spatial distribution. <laughs> Sure. So it is. Good luck. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Lisa, for the comment. I think you can look at the TS diagram to start with. So if there is any different water mass and stuff like that. Um, uh, is there any more question from the audience? No, I think uh, I'd like to invite all of you to give uh, all the speaker a big proud. It's a uh, a well done job okay thank you thank you very much for the uh presentations i think that's all i should do for moderating today's session i going to hand over to krista for the final excitement okay we are going to have the award ceremony krista hello everyone so i first want to say Thank you to everyone for attending. I'm very, very pleased that we finally realized successfully this virtual summer school. And I'm very pleased with the way it has gone this past week. So, so yay, thank you very much. And um, before we give the awards, I just wanna say a big thank you to all the lecturers, practical leaders and chairs and the organizing committee and especially Mindfully Wired for, for pulling it off. So it went really pretty smoothly. Um, so thank you for that. And one last point before I start the awards. Um, I started a community meetup in the, in the Hoova and I had it in the wrong time, which I guess several of you noticed. So if you can still join to give some informal feedback on the school, that would be great. And it would start at quarter to the hour. So if you still have time and I didn't mess up your schedules by putting the wrong time, then I would really, really appreciate some few words just short and informal after this is over. So come to the Hoover platform and, and join that meetup. Okay, so now I give everyone their, I start the award process. The five of us here today, right now on the screen are gonna give out the awards. And I start with the two for social media post and um, best photo. So the first, so those are the 250 um, US dollar awards. The social media award goes to Charles Addy, so yay. I don't know who's here. So I think we're not going to spotlight the students. So congratulations. And the um, best photo award. Let me just check if there has been any updates. It's been going on in the background. So that's Mahendar Rajwar. I hope I say that correctly. Sorry. Um, for the best photo. So congratulations to the two of you. And then I will hand it off now to Jessica Gear who is one of the executive uh, officers of the, um, of the SOLAS IPO. So Jesse. Yes, thank, thanks Krista. Um, yeah, thank you so much to all of you who submitted the poster. So we have seen really many nice posters with great and interesting contest, uh, content as well as also some really creative ones. And um, so the prices are 500 US dollar per poster content and creativity per day. And they can be used for education or advancing your scientific career, for example, for travel registration fee for an event or publication fees, for example. And the day one best poster content prize goes to Anna Lunde Hermansson from Sweden with a poster on ship exhaust and scrubbers. Congratulations, Anna. <laughs> and the day one most creative poster prize goes to Benjamin Hütte from Switzerland. Congratulations. And I'll now hand it over to, I think, Lily. Hi, everyone. I'm Lily. I'm from Solas IPO based in China. 
So thank you for being here for the past five days, which makes the summer school a big success. And, and thanks a lot for all your presentations. Believe it or not, it's probably not the first time for you, for you guys to receive the awards, but it's definitely for the, for the first time for me to present awards. I'm kind of exciting, feeling like it's kind of, I'm presenting Academy Awards, but so does Academy Awards. So um, without further delay, the best content award of the second day goes to Philippa Rickard. And the most creative award to Samila Musa Idelisa. Hope I pronounce it correctly. Congratulations. Now I hand it over to Katie. Thanks, Lily. Um, next category will be the day three posters. And again, fantastic job to all of you. It's been really great to see your work. So day three, best poster content, drum roll please, goes to Tierra Brandy Robinson. Congratulations, fantastic poster. Day three, most creative poster, drum roll please, goes to Axel Brusselman. So congratulations to both of you. I will pass it back to Minhan to wrap up with days four and five. All right, okay, that's exciting. So the best poster content on day four goes to Samantha Rush. Congratulations. And uh, day four most creative poster goes to Risa Chiara. Oh, congratulations. Now the final day today, as of today, we have the best poster uh, content winner, Maliha Khan. Congratulations. And the most creative poster winner, Emma Dion. So that's all. Congratulations to you all. It's wonderful jobs. Krista, you want to? Um, so if uh, you want to say a few words okay. to wrap up, you're welcome. All right. Wait, oh, wait, so. wait, 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 before you do, I want to say, I wrote it in the chat, but I want to say it out loud because I kind of skipped over it, that everyone should be very proud of the work that they did. And it was a lot of discussions to figure out who should get these awards. So it is in no way a statement that anybody's um, posters and posts and photos were not good enough. They were all great. And thank you so much um, to everyone for doing all that work. It was really great. So now, Minhan. Yeah, thank you. I, I just want to second uh, uh, Krista to thank you all very, very much. It's been quite a fantastic, awesome, and uh, exciting five days. And uh, probably you know that, as I said, at the beginning of the day, uh, Sora Summer School is really a, a legacy of this uh, international program. And uh, we have uh, uh, a large amount of the Sora Summer School uh, alumni have become uh, the leading scientists in the international uh, community. I think Katie is one of the excellent examples. She was the former uh, uh, Summer School student, and now he She's the leading this one. So uh, I'm very proud of you. And uh, by joining this program, the summer school, and also we really want you to, to stay in touch and uh, uh, being connected with SOLAS and the SOLAS summer uh, uh, community. And we will have, uh, uh, the, the first one was 2005 and I hosted one in Xiamen. It just was a, a fantastic memory, yeah. And the secondly, I just want to say thank to all these uh, uh, speakers and the lecturers and the practical uh, tutors. Of course, the, in particular, the organizing committee led by Krista and uh, the IPO, both Jesse and Lily, but a tremendous work. I think, uh, I think this is the best way we could do, uh, possibly do for a virtual summer school. And this is really challenging and I, I'm, I'm very so pleased this uh, has been so successful. And of course, Paul and Becky, they are the, uh, the, the key player actually put forward the, the, all this platform and they get every details organized. That was fantastic, uh, they, they, they have done the jobs, okay. And uh, then um, I would just, just want to see every one of you. Thank you all very much. and. Uh, Hope you to see you 
on the next summer school, if you stay uh, in the academia on the stay on the, uh, without graduate uh, before graduation. So that's close the this virtual summer school and uh, stay in touch and uh, I, I send you best wish to every one of you. Thank you.